And now we will commence the sixth Korea Lack of Business Summit. The organizer of this summit, IDB Inter American Development Bank, has been contributing to the economic and social development of Latin America and the Caribbean while playing an important role in the global society since its establishment in 1959. The cooperation between Korea and the LAC has continuously expanded since Korea and Brazil established diplomatic ties in 1959. And today, I believe that this summit and forum will serve as a significant milestone in further strengthening the already strong ties between Korea and LAC. And the purpose of this business forum as a part of the summit is to provide a deeper understanding of the market environment of each region and expand economic and commercial relations through stronger networking among public sector leaders and private sectors. So now, without further ado, let us begin the opening ceremony. And first and foremost, it's my great honor to invite Mr. Song Woo Kim, Deputy Minister for International Affairs of the Ministry of Economy and Finance of the Republic of Korea to deliver his opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Good morning, buenos dias. I am the Deputy Minister for International Affairs of the Minister of Economy and Finance, Kim sung wook Vice President Benino Lopez Benitez of the IDB, Chairman Hee sung yoon of the Export Import Bank of Korea, President Chung yo yu of Kotra, and all the distinguished guests, it is a pleasure to greet you. Thank you for joining us at the 6th Business Summit. Back in 2011, I was in charge of preparing the second business summit as a director at MOEF, and 10 years have flown since then. This event throughout the years has developed into a platform for cooperation with forums, seminar, and business consultations being held. I hope that for greater cooperation between Korea and LAC nations, productive discussions and active networking can take place. Korea and LAC nations, based on similarities of our sentiments and development paths, are partners in cooperation that motivate each other and move forward together. Since Korea joined the IDB in 2005, Korea and the IDB have laid the foundation for cooperation in multiple areas, including project identification, financing, knowledge sharing, and human resource development. The number of Korean employees in the IDB has grown from 3 to 40, and the number of KSP joint consulting projects that have been carried out has increased to 54. Also, the EDCF co-financing facility has also been renewed for the third time in August last year. With four Korean trust funds worth $250 million, we have supported 580 projects in various fields. As a result, over the past 17 years, the volume of trade between the two regions have more than tripled, and investment has grown by more than five-folds. In addition, Korea has made active efforts to conclude trade agreements such as signing FTAs with Chile, Peru, and Colombia, and negotiations with Korea-Mexico FTA has been resumed after 14 years. The cooperation between Korea and LAC has achieved remarkable quantitative growth over the past 17 years. Distinguished guests, based on such quantitative growth, we aspire to grow to a higher level in terms of quality as well. And to this end, I would like to highlight three directions for future cooperation. First, customize cooperation based on digitalization, utilizing data, smart technology, and AI. LAC nations account for 37% of global e-commerce, and the demand for cybersecurity, platforms, and fintech technology is on the rise. Accordingly, Korea, based on its advanced digital capabilities, is supporting the strengthening of digital capacity of LAC nations as such demand is on the rise. Through EDCF co-financing, we have provided 
$35 million to improve the Customs and Tax Administration system of Ecuador. And within this year, by signing an MOU between the IDP and related organizations such as the Public Procurement Service and through trust funds and technical cooperation, we plan to support the introduction of electronic procurement systems in major LAC countries. Second, support for capacity building in the private sector through the expansion of networking opportunities of businesses. IDP has recently been focusing on new financing opportunities and utilization of private resources. In addition, cooperation with large Korean companies, uh, infrastructure companies, startups are being actively pursued Sued. Accordingly, the Korean government will also host opportunities for networking and technology exchanges among businesses in both regions and seek investment and technical support measures that can promote the growth of Korean and LAC startups. Third, diversification of cooperation areas for sustainable growth. Up till now, Cooperation between the two regions has been rather simple, centered around trade of raw materials, agricultural products, and manufacturing. However, in the future, we plan to expand cooperation to various areas such as digitalization, agricultural innovation, climate change response, and SME promotion, which are the foundations for sustainable growth. Korea supports financing of businesses through trust funds and co-financing, and intends to provide knowledge cooperation through KSP. We plan to actively introduce opportunities to participate in LAC cooperation projects to competent private organizations and institutions such as Korean companies, research institutes, and universities. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a Spanish saying that uh, that goes, mas ven cuatro osos guedos, which means that when you look at a problem from multiple perspectives rather than trying to solve it alone, you can better understand the essence of the problem and find a better solution. And with this maxim, I am once again reminded of the importance of mutual cooperation. The challenges confronting the world today are a complex crises that cannot be solved independently by a single country alone. To solve them, we must combine our wisdom. I hope that this event today will prove to be a venue where we can gather our wisdom and capacity to turn today's crisis into opportunities. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Deputy Minister Kim, thank you for gracing this forum with your meaningful words and thank you for delivering your words on the cooperation between Korea and Elec. Thank you once again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, next we would like to have our second meaningful opening remarks. This time, please join me in welcoming Mr. Benigno Lopez Benitez, Vice President for Sectors and Knowledge of Inter-American Development Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Good morning to everyone. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, it's a pleasure to be here in Seoul, the crossroads of ancient culture and cutting edge technology, and the capital of the thriving country that is far away from Latin America and the Caribbean, yet so important to the region. I want to thank Deputy Minister for International Affairs, Sin Yuo King, Exima Chairman, He Young Young, and Cultural President, Young Yol Yu, for sharing the stage with me and for being partnership in organizing the sixth edition of the Korea and LAC Business Summit. This event is the latest example of the Korea's steadfast support for Latin America and the Caribbean, and for the economic and social development of the 26 borrowing member countries that the IDB serves. The commitment was never more evident than during the pandemic. During those terrible days, Korea collaboration with us to provide critical technical assistance grants and financial help to Latin America and the Caribbean is coping with the twin health and economic crisis. Korea has provided more than $1.6 billion in development assistance to the region since 2008. Of that total, $550 million has been financed and leveraged through the IDB in areas such as support for innovation, poverty reduction, private sector development, and public sector capacity building. 
Indeed, that accomplishment and this gathering are a testament to Korea's great foresight. Your government and business leaders recognize that in our complex and interconnected world, supporting the growth and prosperity of Latin America and the Caribbean ultimately means supporting the growth and prosperity of Korea. Today, I'm looking out across our audience of hundreds of investors and other participants. I see the massive potential for mutual benefit right before my eyes. And that is especially the case given the global economic context in which we gather today. Right now, governments and companies around the world are in the process of adjusting to tectonic shifts in the trade landscape. The pandemic, fragile war in Ukraine, geopolitical tensions, and natural disasters worsened by climate change have all fed the continued realignment of global value change. The quest to increase the resilience of those changes and to diversify them is very much on. But amid the uncertainty, there is also great promise, including for Korea and the countries of the Americas to forge more, more robust trade connections. Now is the time to take this country commercial relationship with Latin America and the Caribbean to the next level and convert untapped potential into diverse and mutually beneficial gains. This year marked the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relationship between Korea and 15 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm convinced that we can take the relation even further. Commercial figures still suggest much room to grow, but they also reflect an impressive 11.5% annual increase in bilateral trade over the last three decades, reaching a record of $57 billion last year. The Korean private sector has invested more than $26 billion in the region in the last 20 years. And after a brief decline as a result of the pandemic, those investments have once again risen. They surpassed $2 billion in 2021, accounting for nearly 6% of this country's outward investment flows. Recently, POSCO has pledged to invest $4 billion in Argentina to strengthen its position in the value chain for lithium batteries, where demand is soaring. LG Electronics is planning to expand operations in Brazil and Mexico. Doing, doing so will allow the company to increase its production of monitors, laptops, and parts for electronic vehicles for General Motors supply chain. This investment enable the growth and deeper insertion of Korean companies in the Americas. At the same time, they will create thousands of high quality jobs and millions of dollars in new exports. Over the next two days, we also want to think big. Beyond just commerce and goods and services, this relationship has to be the potential to contribute to solutions to some of the world's major challenges. Together, we can go even further, strengthen energy security and fight climate change. For Latin America and the Caribbean, access to clean energy resources and technology enabled by Korean investment can help shift demand to our renewables. The benefit may be even bigger for Korea's energy agenda. In the shorter term, the region's oil reserve could help Korea secure its energy supply virtually free from geopolitical risks. This can be critical to a smooth transition to more sustainable renewable sources. Latin America and the Caribbean has an energy matrix that is cleaner than the global average and much less reliant on fossil fuels than Korea's. By shifting some of its energy intensive industry to the region, Korea will reduce its emissions as well as those of the world. It will also be a cheaper for Korean companies to buy carbon offsets in Latin America and the Caribbean Darian, rather than at home. Another major crisis that the world faces today is on our dinner tables. Latin America and the Caribbean provides 15% of the global food export and is the largest net exporter of food and agricultural goods in the world. It is also one of the most productive with great potential to help stabilize and lower international food prices benefiting consumers in Korea and elsewhere. At the same time, addressing the food crisis cannot mean more deforestation and emissions. 
A partnership with Korea can significantly contribute if we leverage this country's world renewable innovation to help Latin America and the Caribbean responsibly increase agricultural yields. Korea is, of course, one of the world's leading suppliers of information and communication technologies and related goods. It can therefore play a major role in the accelerated region digitalization, which is key to its development. The IDV has been working with more determination than ever to strengthen the Latin American Caribbean size of this equation. This consists of significant investment in regional integration, a strengthened value chains, export promotion, a new level of work with the international private sector, and ambitious support for clean energy and digitalization. To complete the equation, we must do more to advance free trade between Korea and the region, including in areas of taxation, environmental and labor provisions, and logistics. Increased political and business engagement between Korea and the region is required, and this summit is a strong example and opportunity. The five previous editions generate thousands of matchmaking meetings, and the last one in 2019 generate $6 million in expected deals. I expect this summer and this summit to break records and turn these exciting opportunities into reality. The IDB will continue to serve as a bridge for this relationship. We want to continue connecting Korea to government and business across Latin America and the Caribbean, helping channel your expertise, financing, and innovation to where it's needed most to the mutual benefit of both economies. Let me once again thank the government of Korea for your invaluable contributions to our bank, which has improved so many lives. Thank you also for working with us to make this great event a reality. Let's make the most of it to advance sustainably inclusive growth for us all. Thank you very much. Vice President Benigno Lopez Benitez, thank you very much for your warm words and I thank you for the support for mutual prosperity. And ladies and gentlemen, we would like to hear opening remarks delivered by Mr. Ki Song Yun, a chairman and the president of the Export Import Bank of the Republic of Korea. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause. <laughs> Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Honorable Benigno Lopez Benitez, Vice President of the IDB, and Deputy Minister Kim Sung Wook of MOEF, and President Jong Yoo Yu of COTRA, also ministers, deputy ministers, and ambassadors to Korea representing LAC nations, business leaders from Korea and the LAC region, and distinguished guests from home and abroad, welcome to the sixth Korea LAC Business Summit. This year marks the sixth anniversary of the Korea LAC Business Summit. Since first held in 2007, the Korea LAC Business Summit has served as a solid bridge connecting Korea and the LAC nations despite our geographical distance, as well as a place of exchange promoting mutual understanding and broadening opportunities for economic cooperation. At this year's Business Summit, the trade and investment performance between Korea and LAC nations will be discussed, and supply chain reorganization in the post-pandemic era response towards climate change, digital transformation, and other issues pertaining to the sustainable growth of the LAC region, as well as potential areas for Korea-LAC future cooperation will be discussed in in-depth. Distinguished guests, celebrating the 60th anniversary of diplomatic ties, Korea and LAC has gone beyond diplomatic, friendly relations to become partners for economic and cultural cooperation. Since Korea became a member of the IDB in 2005, the amount of trade between Korea and LAC has increased by 2.5 folds. Korea's investment in LAC nations has increased by 20 folds, and the scale of EDCF financing support in the LAC region has increased by 14 folds. In addition, starting with Chile in 2003, FTAs were signed with Peru in 2011, Colombia in 2013, and five Central American countries in 2018. Currently, the Korea LAC cooperative relationship has been steadily strengthening, including the FTA negotiations with Mercosur. 
In addition to economic cooperation, human and cultural exchanges between the people of the two regions continue to grow, and in Korea, coffee from Latin America such as Colombia and Guatemala and wine from Chile and Argentina are enjoyed daily. In the LAC region, BTS, Squid Game, and other K-pop and K-dramas are growing in popularity, and there are 350 Hallyu clubs in Latin America, and the number of club members, I understand, has reached about 12 million. Distinguished guests, recently Latin America is facing social and economic crises such as pandemics and natural disasters, while at the same time facing the greatest opportunity and transformation in its history. In 2020, the growth rate of e-commerce in Latin America stood at 37%, the highest in the world, and the ratio of renewable energy generation at 59%, showing that this region is leading the global response towards climate change. In addition, utilizing a population of 640 million, abundant energy, water, and food resources, forests, and oceans and other natural resources, the region is preparing for the era of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Since its establishment in 1976, the Export-Import Bank of Korea, through its contributions in fostering Korea's heavy and chemical industry, overseas investment, and financial support for large-scale infrastructure, has accumulated experience of contributing to Korea's growth into a world-class export powerhouse. In Latin America, we have provided $5.4 billion in financing for large-scale projects such as Metro Combined Cycle Gas Power Plants, LNG and Copper Mines in Panama, Mexico, Peru and Chile. Recently, to actively respond to increasing uncertainty in the global financial markets, disruptions in global supply chains and energy security challenges and other developments in the rapidly changing post-pandemic external environment, we have been expanding financing for future strategic industries such as hydrogen, as well as climate change response related and other eco-friendly industries and strategic industries for project sourcing such as nuclear power and defense. In the future, we will continue to utilize all financial means owned by the Export Import Bank of Korea such as export financing, the EDPF, and a special account for supporting projects in high-risk countries to actively assist Korean companies when they receive orders for large-scale infrastructure and PPP projects in Latin America. In addition, as an organization that implements the Economic Development Cooperation Fund, the EDCF, and Korea's Knowledge Sharing Project, KSP, Exim Bank will continue to make efforts to effectively meet the development demands of Latin America and the Caribbean, which is increasingly diversifying to include areas areas such as climate change, response to health crisis, and digital transformation, in addition to sharing Korea's experience and model of economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Mexican poet Octavia Paz sang that the world changes if two look at each other and recognize each other. El mundo cambia si dos se miran y se reconocen. So once again, this means that the world changes if, the, if two look at each other and recognize each other. Through the 6th Korea-LAC Business Summit, I hope that Korea and Latin America and the Caribbean nations will become partners who truly understand and acknowledge each other, solve various challenges facing the world together, and change the world together. Lastly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the IDB, Ministry of Economy and Finance, and Cultural officials for their hard work in preparing for this event. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Chairman and President Yun, thank you very much for gracing this forum with your remarks. Thank you once again. Next up, last but not least, we'd like to hear one final opening remarks. This time, please join me in welcoming Mr. Tong Yeol Yu, the President and CEO of Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause. It is a pleasure to meet you all. Deputy Minister Song Kim, Kim, Benigno Lopez Benitez, Vice President of the IDB, He Sung Yoon, Chairman and President of Exim Bank of Korea, ladies and gentlemen, members of the business community, good morning. I am Tong Yeo Yu, I am the President and CEO of Kotra. Thank you very much to all of the members of the Korean business community for coming here despite your busy schedules and of course all of our friends from LAC region who have traveled a long way to be with us today. This year is a very important and significant year as it is the year where 60 years ago where we established diplomatic ties with multiple LAC region countries and now 
after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that has made it life difficult for us over the past two years is slowly unwinding. We are now having this flagship project on Korea-Lac cooperation, Korea-Lac business summits in an offline basis, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Recently, we've seen supply chain risks from China, prolonged Russia-Ukrainian war, deepening tensions between U.S. and China, and concerns of a global recession. These are aggravating the global trade environment. And in this context, the fact that we have many high-level government officials from Korea and Latin America, members of the academia and the business community here in one place to discuss strengthening the global value chains, responding to climate change, and digital transformation is quite significant. I think that this is a very meaningful and time timely summit. The LAC region is rich in lithium, niobium, copper, and other different reserves of key minerals. If we can, in a Korea, work together with the LAC region countries on exploration, development, and processing of these core minerals, and if we can mutually work to strengthen the value chain, then I believe that we can contribute to economic development as well as strengthening of the stable value chain. We must also respond to the worsening climate change. I understand that lag region countries are also showing a huge interest on solar and photovoltaic energy and green hydrogen and other eco-friendly energy resources. Furthermore, we are also much interested in digital transformation on smart cities, intelligent transport system, IoT and AI, and various other means to make the economic and social systems more efficient. Now, in response to these changing situations, COTRA is working to strengthen the cooperation between Korea and LAC. In fact, we have invited many clients, members of the business community to meetings today, and I hope that this will be a very excellent opportunity for cooperation between Korean companies and LAC agencies and LAC friends. I understand there is a Mexican saying that says there is no better partner than an old friend. We have been friends for 60 years, and we will continue to be friends going forward as we maintain our mutually beneficial partnership, which will lead to synergy effects in many regions. I wish you all health and good luck. Muchas gracias. President Yu, uh, thank you for your support to boost mutual prosperity through cooperation. Thank you once again for your beautiful words. And ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our opening ceremony. And now uh, we would like to begin first plenary session under the theme of Global Outlook in the post-COVID-19 era. So please be seated. And for your information, during our plenary session, we will have in-depth discussion. If you need any translation service, please use the receiver on your table. Once again, channel 1 is for Korean, and channel 2 for English, and channel 3 will be for Spanish. And please join us until the very end, and we would like to begin the first plenary session shortly. Please remain seated. May I have your attention, please? The moderator and our panelists for the first plenary session, please come up to the stage and take your seats. Please come up to the stage.
Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, we would like to begin the first session under the theme of Global Outlook in the Post-COVID-19 Era. In order to begin the session, we'll now first watch a brief video delivered from Mr. Eric Parado Arera, a Chief Economist and General Manager of the Research Department at the Inter-American Development Bank. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get your attention to the screen. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Parral, Chief Economics and General Manager of the Research Department of the Inter-American Development Bank. Today, I'm going to share with you some thoughts regarding the economic situation of Latin America and the Caribbean, and the main challenges they face in order to build a more sustainable and inclusive growth in times of war and post-pandemic. I'm going to share with you our analysis regarding the economic and social difficulties faced by Latin America and the Caribbean in recent years, including the damage caused by COVID-19 pandemic, the new challenges that loom after the war outbreak in Ukraine, and the opportunities offered by sustainable development for the region. When COVID-19 crisis emerged, the region was already facing a set of complex pre-existing conditions, such as low productivity, weak growth, fiscal deterioration, and growing and social unrest. The pandemic exacerbated this, causing a triple sign stop in Latin America and the Caribbean. It paralyzed human mobility, international trade, and financial flows. The impact was unprecedented. With only 8% of the world's population, the region has accounted for 25% of global deaths from COVID-19. And in 2020, the contraction of the gross domestic product reached 7%, the largest drop in economic growth in the region in a single year since 1821. At the beginning of the pandemic, the false choice between saving lives and saving the economy was discussed in some countries. In Latin America and the Caribbean, there was no such dilemma because both dimensions suffer and a lot. At the end of 2020, the region had the worst performance in the world in handling the health crisis and also suffered the worst contraction of its economy. The pandemic continued to be critical in 2021 and Latin America and the Caribbean remained the region with the most death per 100,000 inhabitants. However, economic activity recovered at a good pace as a result of the countercyclical measures that many countries implemented in the area of fiscal, monetary and financial policies. Now, when we compare the accumulated growth between 2021 and 2019 and the accumulated death since the start of the pandemic, we see that the region seems to be the most affected by the health and economic crisis in these two years, with few exceptions. The region emerged from the COVID-19 crisis poorer, more indebted, and with a productive structure severely damaged. Having not yet fully recovered from this, the region is now facing a new shock, the war in Ukraine. This shock is affecting the economies of the region through different channels. The increase in the price of commodities has accelerated inflation throughout the world, which was already on the rise before the war, and has encouraged a tightening of monetary policy in the US. This has caused a further slowdown in the world economy and an outflow of investment from emerging economies, consequently weakening regional currencies and deteriorating external accounts. This difficult situation is causing a slowdown in global economic activity, particularly affecting Latin America and the Caribbean. IDB calculations show that this situation will leave us even further below from pre-pandemic GDP trends. As we mentioned, the economic slowdown occurs simultaneously with the strong inflationary pressures. These are not explained solely by the war in Ukraine. In fact, inflation began to accelerate from mid-2021, largely as a result of a significant recovery in aggregate demand after the pandemic, accompanied by strong fiscal stimulus that in many cases have not yet been withdrawn. Indeed, inflation in the region has risen sharply, reaching 13.3% in June, well above the increases observed in 2019 and 2020 of 7.3% and 5.9% respectively. Of course, this situation has pushed up inflation expectations for this year above countries' inflation target ranges. However, the market expects that by 2023, inflation will return to one-digit inflation and much closer to the inflation targets. 
To keep it this way, central banks must continue to send clear signals that allow inflationary expectations to remain anchored. In addition to inflation, the war has also had important implications for world trade. Depending on the export orientation, the crisis could strengthen some countries via higher commodity exports and higher tax revenues, at least in the short term. In others, the opposite happens. In general, our region's leak with Russia and Ukraine are low. However, larger dynamics are observed in certain key markets. One of those key markets is fertilizers. The region depends heavily on Russia for the supply of fertilizers, one of the most important inputs for agricultural production in our countries. This is a wake-up call to continue the diversification process, not only in terms of exports, but also in terms of imports. Now, I would like to focus on the macroeconomic stability and fiscal situation of the region. IDB estimates show that in the absence of fiscal reforms, public debt in Latin America will not return to pre-pandemic levels in the medium term. We need efficient, timely, and fair structural fiscal reforms to help us overcome the sometimes difficult to reconcile challenges to stabilize public finances and address growing social unrest. Political leaders must understand that increasing spending in response to social demands must be correlated with public revenue. Fiscal management is complex, especially as debt levels are rising, but our countries need to establish a stable path for fiscal policy and a clear strategy to get out of this crisis. The political economy of tax reforms has always been important, but now more than ever due to growing demands for greater opportunity, inclusion, and equality. Fiscal efforts must also involve institutional strengthening to restore citizens' trust in institutions, the market, and trust among themselves. Much of the growing social unrest is explained by deteriorating economic conditions, but also by low confidence. The lack of trust doesn't only affect political institutions, but also involves the private sector, companies, and the market itself. It is a very dangerous, vicious circle. Weak economic growth slows down poverty reduction and increases the distrust of citizens towards the economic model. In Latin America and the Caribbean, growth has been elusive for the last four decades, in clear contrast to other regions that have managed to develop at a very fast pace. The key to faster economic development in East and South Asia has been the result of significant increases in total factor productivity. The contribution of labor to economic growth in Latin America and the Caribbean has been similar to other emerging regions, but its major constraints have been investment and productivity. But it's not enough just to grow. It is essential that economic growth and development be sustainable. Stakeholders, including employees, customers, and governments are pressing companies to play a greater role in addressing critical challenges such as economic inclusion and climate change. It is recognized that achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals will not be possible without the participation of the private sector. Investors are increasingly focusing on companies, social and environmental practices as evidence mounts that performance in those areas affects long-term returns. To this end, standards for ESG metrics are being developed. Data on company performance in these areas is becoming more widely available and reliable, increasing transparency and generating more scrutiny from investors and other stakeholders. Why is this important? Unfortunately, the absence of sustainability metrics and standards often means that through our investments, we run the risk of promoting and or financing unethical practices that we don't identify with, but unfortunately cannot detect. If your answers to these questions you see on the screen are negative, I have some bad news for you. You may be investing in companies that produce nuclear weapons, harm the environment, violate human rights, or are involved in corruption scandals without knowing. In an ADB study, we set out to answer the following question. Do companies that commit to complying with ESG sustainable standards sacrifice economic profitability for doing so? A first look at the global returns of ESG companies versus companies that are not involved with these standards shows that this doesn't seem to be the case. There is also no greater volatility associated with companies committed to complying with ESG standards. On the contrary, 
very significant differences are observed in the commitment of these companies to sustainability goals. On average, these companies follow a more responsible behavior in the use of water and energy and have a lower intensity of greenhouse emissions. Through a counterfactual exercise, we compare each of Chile's sovereign wealth funds by exchanging the sovereign wealth funds equity and fixed income benchmark with their ESG equivalents to demonstrate that financial returns are not different. We perform a similar exercise for Chile's pension funds. For each pension fund, we construct an ESG portfolio with the same allocation as that fund's average allocation to show that in most cases, ESG portfolio performance exceeds the fund's average allocation. The results clearly show that ESG investment didn't in any way imply a loss of return. In conclusion, the macroeconomic conditions we are experiencing are increasingly challenging. Policymakers must commit to reforms that strengthen institutions, stabilize public finances, make it possible to face the growing social crisis, and lay the foundations for more dynamic economic growth. Also, policymakers and the private sector must understand that this economic growth must be sustainable. As we have seen, being sustainable doesn't mean rejecting economic growth and financial well-being in any way. This is a false dichotomy. In this, there is a great opportunity for the private sector to be part of the solution. Many thanks. Thank you very much for the meaningful video. And now we would like to start the first plenary session. And now uh, we'd like to introduce our panelists and our moderator. Uh, they are onto the stage, but before we introduce them, may I kindly ask all of our panelists onto the stage, please remove your mask since we're live streaming online as well. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation. So now please allow me to introduce our moderator, Mr. Kyungwook Ho, Senior Advisor of Pe Kim and Lee LCC and a former Ambassador of Korea to the OECD. And he will be leading the session. And next, we're also joined by distinguished panelists. We're joined by Ms. Hema Sacristan Postigo, Chief Investment Officer of IDB Invest. And we're also joined by Mr. Fernando Adinho Grillo, the Director of Market Intelligence Asia Pacific at Embraer Commercial Aviation. We also have Ms. Estenia Lateza, Vice Minister of Investments and Exports of Paraguay. Thank you very much for your participation. And last but not least, we also have Dr. Yongbom Kim, CEO of Hashid Open Research and former Vice Minister of the Ministry of Economy and Finance of the Republic of Korea. And now I'd like to pass over the microphone to our moderator. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be a moderator with such a distinguished panelist. As Mr. Parado just has presented, COVID has inflicted significant damage to the world, particularly to the lag region. Now the world faces a daunting challenge of rebuilding social economic system in an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable manner in an environment with high inflation, war, and high debt. The pandemic has also accelerated the existing trend of digital and green transformation and our recovery efforts and opportunities will be focused on these two areas. Today, I'd like to explore these issues with this distinguished panelists. To be inclusive and resilient and sustainable is our new development mantra. And my first question is about this, to be inclusive, because the pandemic has inflicted more damage, disproportionate damage to the vulnerable groups like women or the youth or the rural area. So I'd like to ask what each country or organization has done to protect these groups, or what are their future plans, as well as we can be a little bit more forward looking, how can you prepare, particularly the young people, for the future, for the new development needs and the private sector needs. So let me ask this question, 
and ask the panelists to share the experience. Should we start from far end, for example, private sector? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. A great, great pleasure to be here. Um, I feel very, very honored. Um, it, it's such an important topic, how to prepare the youth uh, for the future and how to, to, let's say, be more resilient um, for the economic cycles that are in front of us. I think um, uh, my company produces airplanes in Brazil. It's a kind of unique proposition for the country. Uh, we are not so well probably known for that. We are certainly known for coffee and other things. Um, but Airplanes is a high technology company. Um, I've been spending the whole week here visiting the airlines in Korea, uh, talking about opportunities for um, um, product development and also for um, uh, our product uh, benefit for the airlines, right? We manufacture regional jets. Um, and uh, one thing that caused my attention every time we go to the meetings is um, how young uh, the, the people that we meet are, right? And how enthusiastic they are. I think there is a great deal of preparation from the Korean counterparts uh, for the youth. This is very clear. So education is really, seems to be right high top on the agenda. And, and when I look to, to my own country, I see that uh, there is a lot of opportunity to develop. Um, we, as a private company, we do sponsor um, uh, a very high level school, uh, mid, mid school and high school for underprivileged kids in, in the area that we actuate, which is Sao Paulo State. Um, and, and that's something that we've been doing for many years. And I, I, I really believe that's fundamental to continue. Now, this is the youth as they become uh, as they grow and they enter university, of course, they are going to have a very positive view on technology in Brazil. That's kind of unique. Now, when you look at uh, the rest of the world, I think we need to do a lot more to include uh, capability on the pilots, uh, pilot generation. This is a very specific example, right? So we don't see many women flying airplanes, and I think that could be work it out. So um, we have some targets internally to our company, not for pilots, but our leadership of our company to become 25% uh, at least, right, women uh, on the, the ESG governance. We specified that and it's a kind of strange, why not 50%, right? Why not more? So th the question is that you need to first set up some targets so people can start moving in the right direction. Uh, and in a high technology company on engineering and aviation, it's, it's actually very hard to engage from childhood uh, on especially STM, uh, science and technology uh, interest, the, the women. So we need to, to start in a way early, but we also need to bring top down some targets that the, the young can see that they have opportunities. Lots of things to do. I'm sure uh, during this uh, event, uh, all the leaders here can discuss uh, deeply about that. But I think it adds a lot of value to companies in particular. OK, so we should seek that. Thank you. Uh, what about the Paraguay experience, Vice Minister? Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Horror. It is a great pleasure to be here sharing this panel with all of you. So in the experience of Paraguay, there are two different moments. First of all, it's pandemics itself that arrived like an announced, and we all had to take our own measures in order to tackle all the consequences of the pandemics. From one day to another, um, I mean, all the people had to lock down. And the problem was informality main, mainly, because most of these people couldn't rely on the, on the, on the public services to take care of their health. And uh, most of them didn't have um, jobs that could provide for themselves uh, during the uh, during the uh, the pandemics. So th that was a problem. The state had to do something we usually don't do, which is starting subsidizing the people so they can get along with their lives and then to protect them. It's a very rare case for Paraguay because in times of, of pandemics, I mean, extreme poverty was reduced due to the measures taken properly and at the, uh, the right time. At the time, we didn't know if we were doing right or wrong. All we knew that is we had to protect life and we had, uh, had to protect well-being in the beginning. Secondly, in this moment when we are in the uh, path of recovery, we are doing, I would say, not excellently, but we are doing quite well. We don't think there are formulas that apply for, for, for everyone. Each country has to find their own ways to tackle the inequalities and the problems and uh, to try to go back to where we were before and to do it better. You know, we heard a lot, I mean, this build back better, you know, sustainably, 
et cetera. And we are trying to do both. Right now, we, what we are doing is, firstly, we are trying to attract more and more investments because we think that the private, private sector participation into the uh, doings of the states is, is, is very important in this moment. We need more involvement of the private sector and not only from national capitals. We are talking about also international capitals. So what we're doing here is working on improving the uh, business climate and doing a lot of reforms that had to be tackled in order to prepare our soil to be fertile and to let all the investment grow. Because this is the way as um, the people who were preceding me in using the word were saying, we need to create quality jobs. And I mean by that, those jobs that create real opportunities of a fairer future. I mean, the job is not only the one that provides uh, social coverage in Paraguay, but it's also responsible for providing new opportunities. So these people, the young people that uh, Fernando was talking about, can really find a way to improve their knowledge and to get into the, this very complex world. We are living in a very uncertain times now, right now. They call it uh, Vika times, you know, because the times are volatile, uncertain. We are living in a very complex scenario and we don't know where the next uh, crisis is going to strike. So we need to prepare, we need to get to work on resilient, and we need to bring everybody on board because these uh, social differences are going to help us tackle the next crisis probably better than we did with this one. We didn't do bad in Paraguay. We managed to keep on growing during the pandemics. We uh, were like, we kept working on several important aspects, but we are sure that here, this is not the right moment to impose more burdens on the state's shoulders. States should right now concentrate into recovery, into balancing the debt. And uh, we should rely more in the private sector participation through investment, triple impact investments in order to create these opportunities and to look at the future in a better way. That's the way we want to create our own miracle. You in Korea here did it and you did it very well. We wanna take the lessons, learn the lessons from you but doing at our own pace and trying to do it the best way we can. So thanks very much for your question. And what about the IDB perspective, from the IDB perspective? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to stay here today. Um, for us uh, at the IDB Group, we are convinced that the region uh, needs an inclusive and a sustainable recovery. So. Um, Focusing on your question about youth, uh, we are working uh, as a group uh, together with our colleagues at the IDB and IDB Lab in really uh, working on educational program, uh, programs. Uh, we are trying to um, change a little bit the scope of the traditional education curriculum to really focus on how we can really um, facilitate um, uh, the training around uh, the skill of or the, or the different kind of skills of the 21st uh, century. Um, uh, one of the main goals of the region is to attract uh, investments uh, and to really encourage uh, um, um, uh, intra-regional uh, investments as well. But one of the main challenges sometimes we are facing is that we don't really have um, the people uh, to really uh, to really work on certain uh, uh, duties and skills. So working on preparing our people uh, for this uh, 21st uh, century uh, skills that are much needed, especially uh, on the digital world. Uh, and as I said, working uh, as a group and especially with uh, the governments to really change their mindset about which is the curriculum we are going to need in order to prepare our people to be ready to compete uh, in a global world and especially nowadays where uh, uh, we are, um, I mean, not only in Latin America, but worldwide, we are facing uh, certain problems to really attract, but also to really be able to uh, uh, compete and to maintain our people in the jobs. In jobs. Thank Not you. only for the young, I think the IDB has been pioneering 
uh, gender bonds and gender lending investment. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that aspect? Yeah, for sure. Um, for us, uh, gender equality and diversity is, is uh, one of our fifth, uh, five priorities of the IDB Group Institutional Strategy called uh, Vision uh, 2025. Uh, uh, we are really working on uh, what is called gender lens investments, which basically is the opportunity of uh, getting financial returns, but also advancing uh, in gender equality. Traditionally, Latin America was pioneer on some of the, of the, of the financial practices that works on that regard, especially on uh, microfinance. But later on, uh, since 2012, and joining efforts with our colleagues from IDB Lab, we started working uh, um, with banks in the region to really see the opportunity of women's uh, market. And as of today, uh, we have already supported more than 25 banks to really find uh, the opportunity um, to support women, especially women-led uh, SMEs. So at the beginning it was mo it was more micro uh, loans and loans. I mean more in that uh, uh, spectrum of the private debt. But uh, since uh, 2019 we've been promoting uh, gender bonds, uh, and since then we have already supported seven, uh, six uh, with uh, IDB Invest, but one with uh, our colleagues from the IDB um, really uh, help. Uh, FIRA, which is a public bank in, in Mexico to issue the first uh, public sector gender bond in the region. So, uh, as of today, we are very proud to say that Latin America and the Caribbean is the region in the, uh, in the, uh, of the world or in the world that have already supported the most um, uh, gender bonds. So, uh, 14 as of today with, uh, with 12 uh, issuers and, and really there the focus um, uh, has been um, working on uh, supporting uh, women-led uh, SMEs, um, and um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we are going to uh, see more of these uh, uh, opportunities because now with the uh, ESG boom and the and the sustainable investment opportunity, we see that gender uh, could be a clear path uh, to really have a more inclusive recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing uh, basically Latin American experience. So what about Korea's experience on, on this aspect? Yeah, I'll speak. Uh, Dr. Herrera, TV economist. As it was mentioned by Dr. Herrera, chief economist, well, the pandemic brought about big shock. And one of the characteristics of the shock brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic is that not only economic difficulties, but also there was a shock placed on the KPI. For example, those who have jobs and households were uh, less uh, impacted compared to the vulnerable. So in the short term, if you look at the youth, well, they have to enter into the job market, but because of the shock in the short term was so big, the youth has been greatly affected. And in terms of inequality, we can see that the inequality has worsened because of the pandemic. This has worsened existing challenges. And as we heard from the chief economist, and also as it was mentioned by the moderator as well, well, there is a silver lining to the recent pandemic. That is, the pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation. Digitalization has been forced upon us in some sense because of the pandemic. And so we have seen an acceleration of digitalization, not only in advanced countries, but also if you look at the the lack region, we can see that countries that had low level of digital penetration, digitalization has also accelerated. And so we can see that there is a full-fledged implementation of the digital revolution. And also in Latin America and the Caribbean, fintech and blockchain and the block and platform unicorns are increasing in number. So we can see perhaps that's the silver lining of the pandemic. And as digitalization continues and accelerates, well, we can see that the new frontiers of digitalization is appearing before our lives in the LAC nations. And also, if you look at the demographics of the Latin American countries and the Caribbean, uh, the, there's a young population. And so the digital transformation can benefit from such a young population in the region. And so... I believe that the LAC region 
can move away from its past legacy and embrace these new opportunities. And when they do so, I do believe that there is great potential for further advancement in this nation. So that's a sign of hope. Dr. Kim has pointed a very important aspect. Even though this is a you know, pandemic is a great, uh, in a way, disaster for everybody, but there's a silver lining, and one of the silver lining can be it accelerated digital transformation I think Dr. Kim is in good position to say so because he's now working in the private sector, which is a, a very a company very famous for uh, crypto asset investments. But regardless, as pointed out many times, uh, e-commerce uh, level in Latin America is very high with the younger generation. I think there's a great future. But on the other hand, there's an issue of a digital divide as we move increasingly to the digital age. There's also the issue of how to include those people, young, older people or who are more accustomed to the analog age to facilitate their uh, transfer to the new digital age. And I'm sure, you know, all this digital transformation is the fastest in the uh, private sector. So let me ask Dr. Mr. Grau again, and then we'll take a turn talk about this digital transformation, opportunities as well as challenges. Oh, um, it's a very good point. Uh, uh, with COVID, uh, from aviation and transportation and logistics perspective, we've seen a, a tremendous change and reorientation of trends in the world. So um, clearly, um, more people are having meetings and probably working remotely than ever before. Um, average sector lengths for passengers, of course, have decreased as a consequence. So we see an increased focus on regionalization from the economic perspective, but also as a transportation perspective. Mm -hmm. On the cargo and logistics, we've seen a, a, a massive adoption of uh, delivery door-to-door, uh, -door, right? So businesses now are being required to either partner with the great logistic companies or provide a door service delivery by themselves. That implies uh, more demand, certainly for cargo airplanes, right? To transform the internet of things into, into reality. And this has been greatly accelerated during COVID. So uh, Embraer has been developing, of course, uh, uh, cargo airplanes as well. So we've been looking to this trend. Uh, we also have been also looking to the regionalization and sector length uh, decrease. So we are developing uh, airplanes that will be able to uh, satisfy uh, this kind of sector. Um, and, and finally, the overall awareness on, uh, for the youth on what they want. Mm -hmm. So the youth, the youth uh, they tell us very clearly, we want to protect the, our planet. Right? So, mm -hmm. And that's probably taken to uh, following uh, topics. But uh, on, on aviation, there is a massive incentive uh, to everybody to find uh, green solutions. So these, I think, are, are three mega trends mm -hmm. that have been brought forward, probably accelerated during COVID, the sector length, uh, the internet of things and logistics, and the, the, uh, the importance of uh, sustainability. Uh, can I ask Vice Minister about this pedagogy experience in digitalization? How do you promote it? And what are the difficulties you might have faced in the process? Thank you very much for the question. This is actually a very tricky one because I totally agree with you, as uh, previously said here, that um, technology has expanded during the, uh, the use of technology has been expanded and it was made um, uh, available mm -hmm. to those who could afford that. That's a problem, you know, that happens normally with people that have access, of course, I mean, for the part of a population who can really access, who had a computer at home, who were able to restart schooling using technology or people who works in different types of, of companies or for the government who could use technologies in order to keep on working, that was okay. It was a great opportunity to start using new platforms. And of course, the um, uh, uh, commerce, it was a great step for some of our countries where uh, the uh, digitalization was an option. It wasn't an option anymore. It was an obligation. So from one day to another, we had to start even buying the most uh, basic things using the electronic commerce. And uh, that was a huge step 
-hmm. especially for, for those who wouldn't dare to use it. So actually it's uh, speed up the process, of mm -hmm. course, but it also poses a lot of, a lot of uh, question marks. First of all, not every government has the same capability of uh, investing in connectivity. So some countries were, like the case of Korea, is the third more uh, interconnected uh, country in the whole world. So probably the pandemics, even though it was, of course, had negative effects on people and the access to information and education and uh, and everything, and even and even and even trade, I mean, um, didn't 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 suffer much from this point of view. Mm. Although for other countries, when we didn't have the same level of uh, access, that was a question mark and, of course, a problem, especially for those kids that had to go to school and didn't have how to do it. I mean, of course, the uh, governments started uh, reacting and trying to, with the help of, of platforms and international organizations, to try to make the best out of it. But it was very hard. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, uh, uh, six months ago, we had this first um, research that showed that the quality of the education decreased in, in a very substantive way in Latin America in the, during the pandemics, which is a problem, of course. So here there are three lessons that we have to learn from this. First of all, the state needs to keep on investing mm -hmm. in connectivity. It is very important. It is key for our future. As I said before, we don't know where the next crisis is going to strike back. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's around the corner. We already, in this last two decades, we already had two major crises. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the third one is, but the thing <laughs> is that we really need to prepare for that. And not only as, I mean, I'm talking about the youth, which is critical. And I'm talking about those people who are normally left behind, who are not in the system. Mm -hmm. They need to be in the system. Mm -hmm. It is true that everybody says now, everyone is, uh, there are many, many native, uh, digital natives but it's not true, I mean, mm -hmm. that being able to use a telephone and sending a message or using WhatsApp mm -hmm. is not the only ability to, you need to mm -hmm. prepare for the future. You need to know a lot more and to use these technologies in your favor. So we need to make sure that the state creates the conditions mm -hmm. for accessibility for everyone, not mm -hmm. just for certain groups. So this is super important. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we need to educate. We certainly don't know what the world is going to be like in 10 years. I mean, if something, if we learn something from the past is that uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, uh, 15 years ago when we saw those films, you know, for people talking with holograms, like, like if it was the space for us, it was, oh my God, that is going to happen in 50 years. And no, that reality was made available two years ago. Right now it's the past, not the future. So we have to invest in infrastructure, first of all, connectivity, very key, not only the state, but also we have to invite fresh new capital investing into those areas. Secondly, we have to prepare our people. We need not only to educate, we need to help them learn to learn. Mm -hmm. This is very important. Once you get into this fascinating internet world, there are no limits, but you have to make sure that the people, especially the young ones, have the chance to get to use those tools in a way that it can help them mm -hmm. shape their futures. Okay. Thank you. I particularly like the word, we have to educate a new generation, learn to learn. I think it's a, it's a very, very uh, catch word. And what about the IDB, the multilateral role in digitalization? Yeah. I completely agree what, uh, uh, with uh, what Stephanie just said. Uh, and I really would like to tap on one of the, of the issues she raised, uh, especially regarding connectivity. For us as a group, that is a really important issue nowadays. We already have, or we still have, 100 million uh, Latin American and the Caribbeans uh, without connectivity. So 100 million people is without connectivity. So that is one of our main um, areas of work, both in the public sector and in the private sector. We, in IDB Invest, we are working on different models, trying to pilot and to really prove uh, new technologies in order, uh, in order to reach um, uh, fully ac uh, accessibility uh, as soon as possible. Um, one of the main um, uh, issues we've been working um, uh, has been rural connectivity. And there, um, three years ago, we joined efforts with uh, Telefonica, um, Facebook at that time, eh, Meta nowadays, and CAF. 
And we created a company that was quite innovative at that time called Internet para Todos in order to prove new technologies to reach uh, um, uh, the rural areas uh, with connectivity. Nowadays, we are very proud to say that the model uh, and the business model uh, is working and we are really um, uh, trying to uh, Mm, translate is not really copy, but translate that model to other countries in in, in Latin America. Only Peru, uh, we have uh, six million uh, people uh, out of the out of connectivity. Nowadays, in three years, we have already connected almost four. Uh, so we already have two uh, left, which are I mean, uh, it's going to be <laughs> the most challenging ones because they are really really in these isolated areas in the in the in the rural areas. But uh, we are. Uh, learning quite a lot and trying to uh, to really encourage other countries to take the same path to find new ways new technologies and new business model to really give full uh, connectivity to the whole population thank you you know digitalization basically means connectivity and korea was fortunate in terms of you know, being ahead in terms of the connectivity and I know there are many projects are going on between Korea and LAC region about this, helping digitalization and sharing our experiences. And I, I hope that in through this business summit, there will be more opportunities that can be beneficial for both countries. Now, another dimension of the covering growth is, of course, green transformation. And uh, even though now most people accept that over the longer term, growth and going green goes together, but for the short term, particularly if it's, the speed is too fast, there's a fear and claim that actually uh, this green transformation might hamper the growth at least for the short term. And uh, of course there are some new technological innovation that they can meet both demands sometimes. So why don't you explore this issue about green transformation and how it affects the growth? Now that it's become a pattern, we already start over there. <laughs> no, that's um, um, very good to be in aviation industry. Uh, that's a topic that uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, make us think deeply about how it's not conflicting. but. If, if you stop to think about it, if for aviation is actually not conflicting because nobody in aviation burns fuel just because they want to burn fuel. Fuel is actually is a big um, piece of the costs. And uh, I've, since the beginning of aviation, everybody's trying to reduce fuel consumption as much as possible because it's such an important piece of it. Um, in, in terms of uh, transportation efficiency, when you take a passenger and you fly it X number of kilometers on the air, uh, the amount of uh, emissions is, is less on a passenger kilometer than any other means of transportation. On the land, you need to zigzag around, uh, and the engines are usually piston engines. They are definitely not uh, as efficient as gas turbines. So um, in terms of, yes, of uh, transportation, aviation has always been ahead in, uh, in terms of efficiency or, or let's say impact. Now, um, um, we've been working uh, to further reduce. We have a, a clear targets of uh, becoming a zero uh, net uh, emission by 2050, and this is within uh, the agreements with ICAO and all the international authorities. Uh, aviation is uh, on track to get to a point where uh, it, it will be sustainable probably sooner than that. Uh, we have a big investment as, as an industry in sustainable aviation fuels. And in Latin America in particular, and Embraer, my company, we, we certified the first airplane in the world that was um, certified to fly alcohol, ethanol, um, um, back in 2004. That was uh, Ipanema, that was an agricultural um, um, uh, hopper, a crop duster. That's a small airplane, but because Brazil has such a tradition on using ethanol in the automotive industry, it was a very natural step for our company to go. Now, we are now in the middle of 
uh, the whole industry to try to apply biofuels into jets. So our, our airplanes, our jets are already certified to fly with a blended mixture of a 50% biofuel and 50% fossil fuel. And the idea is to certify by 2030 to have 100% biofuel. We just cannot do that immediately because you need to um, understand the, 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 the impact on systems and fuel lines, fuel pumps, all these details that are being analyzed, but um, up to 50% you can do. So there is a lot of things. Another thing that impacts, I think, operation in, in major city centers is as once the airplane becomes more fuel efficient, curiously enough, it becomes more silent, more quieter. And that is also very important because it matches very well Mullet's uh, um, uh, uh, target to find a, a noise abatement and noise reduction. And why this is important? Because it increases connectivity opportunities to places where have high density population. You can put an airport there. You can operate jets out of the airport, maybe previously only turboprops. And, and then you definitely increase the connectivity opportunities, not only for urban centers, but also for, say, remote islands where you have have short runways and places that you don't have enough space. So more efficient fuel airplanes translate directly into more economic efficient airplanes and more performatic airplanes. They can take off and land for short runways and more silently. So there is a lot of uh, positive loop feedback into pursuing a green agenda. So for aviation, pursuing a green agenda has been always part of the game. It's not contradictory to economic development. Of course, uh, in other areas might be the case, but not in aviation. So just to make it clear. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's very encouraging to hear that maybe next time in the next, this is the sixth and next seventh career lag summit, maybe we can fly with a biofuel jet. Okay, so what? Very rich, uh, the new energy sources I know, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, uh, Paraguay is very uh, big on renewable energies, as you know, our matrix is 100% uh, based on uh, renewable hydro energy. Um, so um, as for Paraguay, the um, how to become greener that we already are in terms of using the energy poses a serious question in terms of um, uh, what we do with the excedent of energy that right now we are exporting, either to Brazil or Argentina? Well, that would be the first question, is how to use it to foster a process of manufacturing which can help us grow using that energy for good, for doing something. Uh, so this is um, something the government has been very concentrated on, so we are right now uh, working to use that energy to create other forms of clean energy. For instance, right now we are fostering businesses orientated to produce two things, fertilizers and green hydrogen, which is another way of energy that is going to be the, uh, the uh, 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 energy of the future, if you might say. Uh, at the same time, we are working, uh, working on even improving our contribution to the emissions. I mean, Paraguay is carbon negative. We are doing very well because of this situation that I already uh, explained. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to do some switches that will allow us to have a more sustainable matrix. And for that purpose, I'm very uh, happy to announce that we are working with Korea in a program for uh, switching our public buses and the whole system to electrical. I mean, we are decided to make that switch to change our matrix for good, to work on this uh, switching, creating and not only producing cars and producing buses that are going to use uh, hydro energy, but also green hydrogen as well. There are already uh, projects that we are working on. So I think we're going to see a lot of changes in the near future. Uh, a third point that I would like to raise here has to do with uh, triple impact investments in the area of energy. Those are very important. Whenever we're looking forward to attract investment, it shouldn't be any kind of investments. We should look for those investments that at the same time can contribute to enlarge, of course, the uh, economical uh, growth they should be. Uh, they should uh, include people 
into uh, the business world, I mean, to, to give them opportunities through work, but last but not least, the impact of this type of investments should be consistent with sustainability, which is very important. So if we are uh, looking forward to attract those investments, and we are working on that because we know that the, uh, uh, the agenda these days is green. Not because we want to, we can deny, we can say, okay, I'm staying like this, I'm not gonna change anything, it is going well for me the way it is, I don't care what happens to the next generation. But the thing is, in the near future, we're not gonna be able to sell anything to anyone unless we do it in a sustainable way. Therefore, every business we conduct should be focused in being consistent with a greener future. And this is a message that we are passing on to everyone, especially our private sector. Sometimes, you know, the private sector, they feel comfortable doing things the way they normally do, but there are changes here and we have to acknowledge them, we have to accept them, and we have to embrace them. If we wanna build it better, we have to take into consideration this, because these days sustainability is not an option, it's a must if we wanna foster development. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Paraguay is very fortunate in terms of its abundant green energy, while Korea imports like 93% of energy sources from abroad, and we are increasingly exploring the possibility of hydrogen energy, things like that, and probably that can open up a new opportunity to work in together. And I'm sure multilateral, like IDB, are also being promoting this green revolution. Mm -hmm. Can you share that experience? Yeah, for sure. Uh, climate change is one of our priorities, and nowadays we have committed that uh, at least 40% of everything we do by 2025 uh, is going to be in this area. And also, we have committed ourselves to be a Paris, fully Paris aligned by 2023, which means that um, from uh, next year, we are going to start um, uh, avoiding uh, supporting uh, some sectors that are not green or that are not in the path uh, to become greener. Um, we are uh, working with our colleagues in the in the in the in the in the public sector on uh, different tracks. Uh, very important to mention that as of today, uh, 15 countries in Latin America, 15 countries, uh, taking into account that we work with 26, uh, 15 is a, a large number of uh, of countries um, already committed to be carbon neutral by uh, 2050. Uh, four are discussing, as of today, uh, uh, net zero targets, and five uh, um, are um, uh, working on reducing uh, their uh, footprint, the carbon footprint. So with our colleagues uh, on the public sector working on the uh, NDCs and on the how they are going to discarbonize uh, their economies, and us in the um, private sector working with um, clients uh, trying on one how uh, to really find out the way to discarbonize their sectors. Uh, we have seen some advancements, especially in certain sectors, uh, for sure in energy and in transport. Uh, as we know, uh, Latin America has done a great job in mitigation. Uh, the real challenge is adaptation, as we know, is one of the areas of the world more effective uh, by climate change and natural disasters. So our focus is on adaptation. Uh, but beyond that is uh, energy, as I said, in transport, uh, a lot of advancements are around electromobility in the regions, especially uh, in public transport. And the third area where we're really working is in uh, land uses. So uh, those are the three areas where we're really uh, working. The opportunity in Latin America um, to work on green finance is huge. It's huge. We really think that uh, it's going to be around 1.3 billion, eh, billion dollars uh, per year, eh, depending on the country 
countries between 7 and 19 percent of the uh, GDP. So a great opportunity to really work with Latin American countries, both in the public and in the private sector, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the green opportunity and how we really find new ways, new technologies to really transition from this brown economy to the, to the green economy. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, because of the time limits, uh, let me just touch one issue. Uh, that is the role between private sector, public sector, particularly about the fiscal balance. Uh, Mr. Parada at the beginning made a presentation that we need a fiscal reform. But at the beginning of the crisis, it's in inevitable that government should play a bigger role and in, the, in that process probably have a fiscal deficit. But now we are reaching the recovery stage and there's inflationary pressure. So some people say the public sector start walk away and reduce its role and to be sustainable, uh, we should actually restore the fiscal balance. But on the other hand, the public sector is still under pressure to support the basic uh, uh, infrastructure like education, protected vulnerable groups, and particularly even though we know the private sector should play a bigger role, but there's so much uncertainty right now, maybe the public sector should continue to play a bigger role for the time being and wait some more time for the private sector to come up. And only then, even at the fiscal uh, uh, deficit, uh, continue to play the role. It's a very delicate balancing and because of the time, I just want to ask Korea's experience and the low-tax country, Paraguay's experience on this issue. Okay? Yeah. Good. Yes. I think that that is a really difficult dilemma because we are suffering shocks right now. And if there are these uh, fiscal shocks, by that I mean where there are vulnerable uh, groups that are suffering more from these shots. So the government's mandate to help them is becoming ever important. However, inflation is going up and there are many investors who are warning about fiscal sustainability as what we've seen in the UK. And so it is very important that we have to use fiscal resources as widely as possible, which is why for different countries around the world, We have to make sure that uh, we do not deteriorate the tax base, but still try to increase our fiscal resources, maybe from the private sector or from the lag region. I understand that uh, the region is so rich in energy and mineral resources, so perhaps these resources can be uh, used to create uh, more of a fiscal support. Right now, in this post-pandemic era, when inflation is really going up and the policy rates have continued to gone up over time, we have to reassess the levels of fiscal sustainability so that we can orient the fiscal resources and place them only when they are really needed and be really prudent and smart about this issue. Senator, can you be a little bit brief on this point? Because we don't have much time left. I'll try to be brief, though. Um, I think this is the right moment for the uh, private stakeholders and private capital to jump in. I mean, traditionally, we let, and I'm talking about Paraguay, of course, I mean, we let this private sector to ta tackle, I mean, um, typical businesses in that area. But not very much involvement of the private sector, for instance, in the infrastructure sector of connectivity sectors. So I think we should, this is the time when we should let the... Uh, uh, the, the uh, stakeholder, private stakeholders to jump in and help us rebuild and rebuild in a different way, generating a, a, a further participation of the private sector in every, in every activity possible. I mean, there are not places that should be only, only responsibility of the state. If we want to build development, we have to do it together. Of course, I don't deny the state has a very important role to play, but right now the state should be concentrated into uh, correcting debt imbalances, for instance, and should be concentrated into uh, stopping inflation, which is a major problem that we are all facing now. I mean, this is this is this is my first um, uh, my first point of view. And um, secondly, I think there are right times. I mean, it's never a right time to increase taxes. That is true. 
It's never right. We are always in certain crisis. We are always uh, facing difficult situations that make it uh, difficult to do it. But in the case of Paraguay, we think that uh, we started, like, first of all, working on uh, the uh, tax system in order to formalize people. We wanted people to be in the system first. And there start talking the conversation about uh, how we're going to deal with and uh, how are we going to, uh, uh, how we're going to finance our development, et cetera. So we are right now in this process. We are doing okay. Taxes, Paraguay has the lowest taxes in the region, which is very attractive for investment, which is what we want to prioritize right now. There will come a time we're going to be ready, maybe to increase our taxation. But it's, this is not the right moment. We are really trying here to foster development. We need to move. We need to speed up our recovery. We need to create jobs, quality jobs. In order to that, we need investment. And if you want to bring investments, you should forget about increasing taxes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me try to close up the session. We had a very uh, interesting, meaningful discussion. Hopefully, they can set the tone for the following sessions. I think we all agreed that digital and green transformation can be at the center of reigniting the growth and both the private and the public sector should play a role. And we should not forget that in the process, we have to keep protecting the vulnerable groups and be forward looking in preparing our human resource development. And one thing I, you know, that really uh, inspires me is that many participants over here, panelists, keep talking about the next crisis to be better prepared. We don't know what is going to happen in the future, but through this experience, we got to be better prepared uh, for whatever crisis might come next. So in, in that sense, we are very much future-oriented and forward-looking. And I'm sure both LAC and Korea face the common challenges in this regard, and by promoting uh, sharing experience and uh, promoting trade, I think we can both benefit. So with these takeaways, uh, let me close the session. And I would like to have a big applause for the distinguished panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for leading our session, our moderator, and thank you for in-depth discussion. And this brings us to the end of our session one, and we will begin the second plenary session shortly in a while. And before starting our second session, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to inform you that on this edition of our summit, we have the participation of 19 um, delegations from Latin America and the Caribbean who will be offering information about investment opportunities in their own countries. So ladies and gentlemen, their booths are just outside of this hall at the foyer. So please visit their booth and have some more information. And we would like to begin the second session shortly in about five minutes. Thank you.
Gentlemen, we would like to begin the second plenary session shortly, so please enter the hall. Also, please take your seats. Once again, we kindly ask all of our participants to be seated. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? We would like to begin the second session, so please enter the hall. Also, please take your seats. And our moderator for session two and our panelists, please come up to the stage and take your seats onto the stage. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to begin the second session shortly, so please enter the hall. Atención, por favor, distinguidos señoras y señores, les invitamos muy cordialmente. En Ladies and gentlemen, the second plenary session will begin shortly. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to please kindly come inside and take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we will begin the next session shortly. Please uh, come inside and take your seats. Begin the second plenary session, so please enter the hall. And also, please take your seats.
Again, we would like to provide a simultaneous interpretation service. So for those who need any translation service, please use a receiver on your tables. Channel 1 for Korean and channel 2 for English and channel 3 is for Spanish. And please turn off all your electronic devices or put them on silent mode. For this session, we are truly honored to have Mr. Fabrizio Operti, Manager of the Integration and Trade Sector at the Inter-American Development Bank to be the moderator of our session. And we are also joined by distinguished panelists. We have Ms. Luz Maria de la Mora, Undersecretary for Foreign Trade of Mexico. And we also have Mr. Omar Paganini, a Minister of Industry, Energy, and Mining of Uruguay. And Sebastian Uribe, International Director for Europe and Asia at Juan Valdez Cafe. We're also joined by Mr. Chung Hee Kim, Deputy Minister for Trade and Negotiations at the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy of the Republic of Korea. And last but not least, we're also joined by Dr. Won Gun Song, Executive Vice President and Head of Business Cooperation Office from Costco. And now I'd like to pass over the microphone to our moderator. Please lead the session. Great, thank you. Um, well, good morning to, to everyone um, and welcome again. This is the sixth edition of the Korea LAC Forum between Korea and Latin America and the Caribbean. Back in 2005, when Korea joined the Inter-American Development Bank, we got together with colleagues, both from the bank and Korea, and said, we have to construct bridges, we have to make more trade and investment happen. And we started back in 2007, and this is a sixth edition. It's wonderful to be in person. We didn't do it in the pandemic, deliberately. We didn't want to do it virtually. And uh, to be here in, in, in this wonderful city of Seoul with all the, all the participants, it's a, it's a real privilege. Long gone are the days where Korea and Latin America looked inward in order to develop. Eh? Those days are long over. On the contrary, trade and investment between our regions have reached record levels, yet the opportunities are far from being exhausted. In fact, in the last 20 years, trade has increased six times, eh? from 10 billion to 57 billion. Um, and I'd like to characterize that trade. Uh, I would say it's a story of three Fs. My name is Fabricio, like the three Fs. <laughs> Fast growth, few countries, few products. Okay? First, fast growth. As we said, 10 to 57 billion in the past uh, 20 years it, and increasing investment as well. Yet few countries. The trade has been concentrated, 90% eh, of the trade has been concentrated in Chile, Mexico, Brazil, and Peru. So there's much to gain for, from the rest of the region. And then few products, lack exports to Korea, have been heavily concentrated in a few agricultural and mining commodities, mainly mineral products, eh, fuels and energy. And then the lack imports from Korea have mostly been manufactured goods dominated by cars, 
ships, and ICT goods. Then the story of investment. Uh, the region has been in the radar of Korea for a very long time, and investments in 2021 surged again, eh, above $2 billion, growing at a faster pace, and listen to this, than any other region in the world, Korean investment in Latin America and the Caribbean. The region's largest economies, again, Brazil and Mexico, have been the main destination of those investments. And then there's the other side of the spectrum, the that is not so looked at, which is the investment of Latin America and the Caribbean in Korea. That reached in the 2013-2020 period 770 million uh, companies, for example, like Mexican auto part producer Capcon is here, Argentinian global leader in the production of food and mouth disease vaccines, Biogenesis Bago, is also here. So to our Latin American participants, undoubtedly, Korea is also an, an opportunity for investment. And last, a few observations before we lead it to the panel. Uh, what can we do to increase the quality and quantity of these bilateral relationships? First, we have to reduce logistics cost. They're still too high. And we're talking about this with many companies. Uh, better ports, better airports, better roads, better border crossings, better connectivity. If we don't do that, the, that trade, that reconfiguration of value chains will not happen. And that's a business opportunity for Korean companies as well in the infrastructure sector. Then we have to reduce investment barriers. I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Bilateral investment treaties, double taxation agreements, free trade agreements. We need to negotiate more market access in both ways. In third, we have to look at services. We always look at trade in goods, but trade in services has grown quite a bit in knowledge-based services, technology in particular, and that's a whole different uh, ball game. Clean and sustainable energy, where our economies and regions are completely complementary. And then last, the cooperation, the bilateral cooperation. Korea has been a generous, innovative, visionary member of the IDB. We've done many things, and a third of that cooperation, eh, which since 2008 has been 1.6 billion, a third of that cooperation has been channeled through the IDB. I know I, I know, I threw a lot of numbers out there. We did research for this event. There's a book that is out there both in Korean and in English that you may take that has statistics on trade, investment, and cooperation. So now I lead to the panel, and I will start with my good friend, Luz Maria de la Mora, under Secretary for Foreign Trade from Mexico. Given, Luz Maria, that Mexico and Korea both rank in the uh, top 20 countries global for digital competitiveness, how can the two countries work together to integrate their digital value chains and use technology to better integrate those manufacturing supply chains? What's your take on that? And welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fabricio, for uh, having us here uh, in Korea. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the Inter-American Development Bank and the Korean government for organizing this very timely forum. And also thank you, Fabricio, for your vision in terms of organizing a forum like this, which is, in my opinion, extremely important to bring uh, two very important actors in trade and investment, especially today, Latin America and the Caribbean with Korea. Um, we, as, as you mentioned, uh, I think that we, we have done some work already in terms of integrating our economies and finding opportunities. Just to let you know, and probably some of you don't know it, but South Korea today is Mexico's third largest trading partner, which is not minor to say. Our trade is uh, close to $25 billion. And I want to say, I want to mention something that I think it's also worth mentioning. Mexican exports and Mexico is, has a more integrated participation in the Korean market. In 1999, our exports were $150 million. Last year, uh, we exported almost $7 billion which um, granted that Mexico's exports are deeply integrated in North America and the U.S. market, it is really, uh, it says something about 
how the Mexican industry, Mexican productive sector, and how Mexico is looking into Asia and specifically to the Korean market. Um, the pandemic showed us that we needed to think out of the box. And digital really helped us not only survive, and uh, in the introduction of this panel, I think it was very clear how the IDV showed us how important uh, digital and technology was for our um, overcoming of the pandemic and how we it, it important ha, how important it has become for us to really um, bridge our differences and also bridge the um, income uh, problems that we had the the challenges that were presented by the confinement and the the reduction of economic growth in, in the region and specifically in Mexico. So I think that, as you said, Fabricio, digital is an extremely important uh, instrument, but we need to find the right environment for um, Mexico, Latin America and the Caribbean to be able to uh, have a more a deeper integration in the production sector in, with South Korea. How do we do this? And let me offer a couple of suggestions on where we are and how we are doing it. One of them has to do with regulations. Integrating our digital value chains has to do with creating the right digital international environment. For that matter, for example, we are working in WTO, in APEC, G20, uh, Mexico in USMCA and CPTPP in a number of areas. For example, we are creating the right rules for data flows, data protection, e-payments. We really need to think different because um, even though we are talking about trading products probably, uh, integrating the digital part into making this uh, trade more efficient, we need to make sure that we have the right regulations. And that is not minor. Industry and technology are going faster than governments. And for that matter, we are doing also, uh, we are negotiating new new uh, regulations. For example, we are trying uh, to, to introduce these models into, for example, the Pacific Alliance, where Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico participate. Um, I think it's important to mention that Mexico and South Korea are in the process of finding closer ways to integrate our economies. One of them has to do with a negotiation uh, of a free trade agreement. Our ministers on March uh, 1st um, signed the, the launching of these negotiations and we're preparing for those. And also in Pacific Alliance. We have welcomed um, South Korea as a future candidate for becoming an associate state. And in that way, we hope that we will be able to create that digital regulatory environment that we need so that we can address issues that you were already mentioning, logistics, transportation, trade facilitation, connectivity, rules of standards. And I, uh, just to finish, I would like to mention that in addition to the regulations, we also need to make sure that we offer the uh, the digital skills that companies, private sector, and our human resources require in the region to make sure that we can take advantage of this great opportunity, which is how we can bring technology to everyone in the region to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that this integration between South Korea, Latin America, and the Caribbean can yield. Thank you. Thank you, Luz Maria. Um, rules of the game and market access. Dr. Song. Welcome. Welcome. How is Korean industry and POSCO in particular thinking about readiness for the future supply chain disruptions in mm -hmm. case they, they occur? And how does the, has the pandemic uh, spurred together? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a very interesting question for the Latin Americans, greater regional diversification. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. And then I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I think that there are several reasons for the disruptions of supply chain. And first one is the deglobalization. Uh, regionalization and the, the tension between United States and China and Ukraine war. And there are lots of contributors for the decline of uh, globalization. So the prosperous continuous increase in global trade we've seen 
uh, we've experienced for the past several decades uh, will not be seen in the near future. We think that so that means the supply chain should be reshuffled and disrupted, and this kind of supply chain disruptions will go on for the time being uh, for more than several years. I think that and right now the global economy is being divided into three regional value chains uh, near. U.S. and EU and East Asia, and this kind of uh, regional uh, regional block uh, will be expanded, and which is contributing to the supply chain change or disruptions. And the last one is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And COVID-19 pandemic, as we already know, the limitations of the flow of human resources and trade due to COVID-19 pandemic uh, created kind of a uh, trade barriers, and then it also created original blocks. Therefore, COVID-19 pandemic also contributed to the disruption of uh, supply chain. You know, Korea is highly dependent upon global value chain, and Korea's participation rate in global value chain is 55%, which ranked first among the G20 nations. And due to this kind of high dependence on uh, global value chain, the uh, Korean economy is very vulnerable uh, to the restructuring or the dis disruption of supply chain. Now, I'm, I'm working uh, for POSCO, and, and I'm working for the POSCO uh, Korean companies. Uh, so Korean companies are interested in the change of supply chain to adapt to the newly structured uh, global value chain. Uh, even though I'm working at the Korean company, I'm not in a position to explain the whole trend of Korean industry. But anyway, uh, for, the, for the case of POSCO Group, for the case of POSCO Group, uh, we are interested in the regional investments of uh, steel and also considering the investments of kind of a, uh, you know, lithium value chain or second uh, materials for the second battery. And so uh, this kind of business uh, into the North American region and also the South American region. Well, we, are, we are investing in uh, Argentina right now. And then uh, we are looking for, the POSCO group is looking for the uh, kind of a place to uh, invest in uh, for the new business and new industries such as uh, hydrogen and uh, materials for the second battery and also the uh, new steel making plant. And so uh, these are, uh, these are POSCO's uh, newly considered investments for adapting to change in newly structured GVC and newly uh, reorganized uh, supply chain. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sun. And hopefully you will find many opportunities here. We have 20 countries from Latin America and the Caribbean present with their investment promotion agencies, hundreds of companies. Tomorrow there's going to be matchmaking meetings. So hopefully a lot of that will, will materialize. Those opportunities will start to get developed. Um, Minister Paganini from my country, from Uruguay, small Uruguay in the, in the south, uh, Korean FDI, foreign direct investment in Latin America, it tends to be in higher value added se sectors compared to other sources of foreign investment. How can Uruguay attract investment from Korea in segments that align with your development priorities, with the government development priorities at this moment? Well, Fabricio, thank you for, for having me. I want to thank also the IDB, the Korean government, this is a good opportunity for Uruguay to present its case in this important forum. And of course, as the rest of Latin America, we are very interested in FDI, foreign direct investment. And specifically, I think there is a very big opportunity for Korean FDI in Uruguay. Of course, we have competitive issues here, but Uruguay has also some competitive advantages. We'll, we'll talk a bit later about the opportunities in green energy. But as a general framework, Uruguay has a very stable rules regarding investments. For many years, we have lots of instruments that capture foreign investments, such as, of course, free zones, 
tax exemptions, uh, freedom of currency exchange, freedom of uh, removing profits from the country, uh, non-discrimination from foreign and local companies, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But mostly, we, we will say rule of law and democracy. Number two, we are in a position to be the gateway to the southwest of Latin America, the entrance port of the River Plate, and a logistic hub and a business hub for many time for many years now. Unfortunately, not so much for Korean companies. It's a good opportunity to be there and to be to see the South of the South America as a place you can attack from Uruguay. But more recently, Uruguay has developed a very strong digital infrastructure, very strong in its coverage of the country, very strong uh, in also uh, the speed of internet access, the connectivity. 90% of the homes and businesses are connected to fiber optics directly, uh, cellular, mobile, etc. During the pandemic, that was critical. We could not, we could, we achieved not to stop the education and move it online because every school boy, in, school girl in Uruguay has access to internet and a device to access a learning platform that was, is called Plan Seibal, for example. And our innovation sector is powerful. We are exporters of software and IT services for many years now. It's number five of our exports, but those are mostly directed to the US. I think there is an opportunity to direct them to East Asia and partnership with Korea could be strategic in, in, in that way. And well, the third, the, the last item I want to underscore is that uh, Uruguay has been very moving very forward in, in renewables and we think there are a lot of opportunities regarding to green hydrogen, but maybe we can get into that a bit later. Thank you, Minister, for your remarks. Um, Mr. Kim, Deputy Minister for Trade Negotiations of, of Korea, welcome. What opportunities does the desire for more secure and resilient uh, value chains offer for bolstering increasing that relationship with, between Korea and Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you. Oh, well, nice. I'm very pleased to be here. Actually, you're, regarding your question, actually, many people will agree that actually many companies globally pay attention to maintaining this resilient supply chain because it matters. But it's not only about the manufacturing industry. Actually, food security and energy security also draw lots of attention from many countries. So one way of achieving that resilient supply chain is to diversify sources of this supply as much as possible. So what does that mean regarding the collaboration and economic cooperation between these two countries, Korea and Latin American companies? I would like to emphasize that we need to expand trade and investments between two economies. That, that will help solve this problem. Regarding this trade, as you suggested, during the recent 12, 20 years, trade value has increased six times. That's amazing. But I think there's more likely chance that we will expand in the future because these two economies are actually a very good partner in this regard. Actually, Korea, the economies and Latin America uh, economic structures are complementary to each other. As you suggested, Korea exports mostly manufacturing products to Latin American countries, and we import lots of agricultural products and raw materials, which means that we can kind of go to the next stage. So there is more kind of room for improvement. So, so that's the first thing. Second thing is that also Korean companies are investing in various kind of sectors from automobiles and steels and raw materials. And um, POSCO actually invests lots of money in Argentina for lithium, which means that once these Korean companies invest in Latin American companies, it only makes not just make become jobs or something like that, but still it can create lots of opportunity for export to other global markets. Actually, when the Postco can finish all this kind of investment in their products, 
factory. Actually, these lithium products will be exported globally, even back to Korea, because we need lots of lithium. So, which all this means that actually this kind of requirement or demand for this re resilient supply chain means that provides an opportunity between these two companies to expand trade and investment. The remaining question is what we should do. Maybe we can find the answer for this two days kind of this conference to answer, find the answer for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Definitely complementarity. We have a third of the world's water reserves. We have the natural ingredients for the future vaccines. We have the lithium for the electrical batteries, and we have great coffee. Uh, and that's where Sebastián Uribe comes in, international director for Juan Valdés. Uh, welcome, uh, Sebastián. Juan Valdés played an important role in transforming Colombia's coffee industry uh, from a vol volatile commodity uh, to a flourishing, vertically <coughs> integrated, uh, sophisticated industry. What lessons from the company's development could be useful to other countries of our region that are exporting also to Asia like yourselves? Well, thank you. Thank you, Fabricio, for, uh, for, the, for the question and the invitation and, and the opportunity to, to tell our, our story. Our story began in, or begins in 1927 when the coffee growers, they get together, they, they gather together, and they created something that is called the Colombian Coffee Growers Federation. So when they, they created the Colombian Coffee Growers Federation, the idea was to have an entity that was uh, looking after them. Um, back then, it was in the um, before the government, but then, as you know, the um, the, the coffee industry started to grow even more in Colombia. Um, they started to think uh, abroad how to how to bring the experience of the Colombian coffee to the to the world. Back in 1959, they created a character called Juan Valdez. And the idea back then was to uh, have initially, that was for the US and Europe, um, to have a character that represents the, the, the coffee from Colombia. And, um, and, and the, um, the idea was so successful that many of the brands, they started to offer in just 100% Colombian coffee. So they started to advance in the, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the value chain. And then in 2002, we created a commercial brand. So the character now, now evolves to a commercial brand. And the idea was to get even closer to the consumer by offering uh, franchises, coffee shops, finished products, and be more more. Uh, be even closer to the to the consumer. So I think uh, you know our our experience not only in uh, in Colombia where we are the number one um, a coffee a, a brand uh, in in the in the premium segment, and um, and and we are also you know with the federation we are the first the third largest coffee exporter in the world. Not Juan Valdez, but the but the entire country. Um, we, we decided to, you know, as I said, you know, to go even closer to the, to the consumer. So some, some experiences or some, um, lessons that we have learned during all this, this time to the, uh, uh, to the other, um, you know, countries or the LAC co community. Um, we can highlight three. First, um, you need to have a clear purpose. A clear purpose is needed when you want to um, when you want when when you want to go to another country when you want to develop or want to launch a product you need to have a clear purpose and a clear object. It sounds simple, but it's very uh, it's very important. Um, get prepared. If if you have a product, if you have a service, if you have something that is working in your country, it doesn't mean that it's going to work 
in other countries and especially in Asia. In Asia, and yeah, and uh, you cannot, you know, you cannot even call, you know, just, just one market. You have in Asia different markets. And especially here in, uh, in Korea, you find a very sophisticated market, a very unique market. So the recipe that we have or that we use in Colombia, in Europe, in the US, we have to adapt it to the, to the local market. So, so you need to think, as they said, globally and act um, uh, locally. And last, um, have an open mind. You need to be, um, you know, always, you know, looking for, for, for um, opportunities, for alternatives. You, you will be surprised where the next opportunity uh, uh, is. So that's the, uh, you know, that's what I, you know, what we can share to the, uh, uh, the LAC community. You need to be prepared and you need to be, uh, you cannot underestimate any, uh, any risks or any, uh, or any opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, innovate, adapt, know the, know the markets. Um, Luz Maria, back to you. Many of today's pressing supply chain uh, shortages occur in certain sectors, amongst them uh, semiconductors, uh, where manufacturers down the supply chain, the suppliers have limited sometimes global visibility. What can Latin American countries and Mexico in particular do to help increase <coughs> that visibility of, of the suppliers, the tier one, the tier two, the tier three, which are part of those supply chains in order to di diversify the risk and resilience? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the question. And yes, you're right. I think that one of the most important challenges that the world is living has to do with restructuring of supply chains. And uh, how do we make sure that the challenges, the tremendous challenges derived from the COVID-19 pandemic, the um, Russian invasion to Ukraine, um, all of the challenges that derive from the logistics uh, disruption, I think that uh, that has forced us all to think about how to make uh, sure that we have resilient supply chains, not only cost effective, not only just in time, but we need to make sure that um, the global um, supply chains operate in such a way that we reduce the vulnerabilities of globalization. I don't think that globalization is gone. I just think that uh, we need to adjust the processes and we need to make sure that as already been mentioned by my uh, colleagues from the Korean government and from POSCO, it is, it is certainly key today to diversify the supply chain. In that perspective, let me share with you, um, as, as you mentioned, Fabricio, there are some sectors that are key and there are some sectors that probably are uh, more important to focus on and that they have to do with semiconductors, information and communications technology, food supply, uh, the medical sector, medical devices, because they have proven to be extremely important for uh, countries to, um, to be able to address those needs. Uh, in this respect, Latin America, and in this particular case, Mexico, has a lot to offer. In Mexico, we have devised a new industrial policy where we have identified these sectors that I already mentioned as a priority in terms of integrating local and SMEs into uh, global supply chains. For that matter, we know we need um, funding, financing. We also need to train companies to be able to participate in global supply chains, as Sebastian was already mentioning. What works locally does not necessarily work globally, so we need to make sure that these companies have the training. And we are also training people. We know that the, uh, the, the talent that we have in Latin America has the capacity, the creativity, and the possibilities of participating, but we need to make sure that we train them. In Mexico, we have the high-level economic dialogue with the U.S. and the high-level economic dialogue with Canada. 
in both of these initiatives that are focused on competitiveness and they're focused also on making sure that we strengthen our supply chains in North America, we have identified a number of areas in which we are working uh, to make sure that we can participate in, for example, the semiconductor sector, for example, making sure that we facilitate trade, facilitate investment, we have the right measures at the border, among others. But uh, I think it's important to also bear in mind that today we have an incredibly, uh, an, a unique opportunity. And this is derived from the subsidies that the U.S. government is offering uh, through the CHIPS Act, that's $52 billion for the semiconductor sector, and also the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed recently and has $389 billion for transformation to the um, to a more sustainable economy, uh, among which, for example, we, we find uh, electric vehicles. So we had a meeting in Mexico with the participation of the Secretary of Commerce from the United States, Gina Raimondo, and she mentioned that the supply chain for semiconductors in Asia uh, is worth $60 billion. And in North America, it's only $3 billion. So you can imagine the kind of opportunities that we have there. And I, I would leave it there. We, we need to focus very strongly on how we take advantage of that opportunity that we have in Mexico and in Latin America to make sure that that semiconductor supply chain is actually developed in our region. We have the talent, we have the companies, we have the financing. We just need to make sure that we take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And Globalization is not gone, it's a new globalization, some call it globalization, regionalization. I have to put a, an advertising ad very brief there for the suppliers. Look at connectamericas.com. It's a platform that we developed from the IDB. More than 15 million users from 200 countries. Opportunities in every sector. That's where the suppliers look for opportunities. And it's a platform that we have developed. Globalization has become also greener. And that, Dr. Song, leads me to uh, the question for you. Uh, if you can share with us, with the audience, how Korea's commitment uh, to net zero emissions by 2050 affects POSCO's uh, value chain decision making and the investment opportunities that it also entails and creates in green tech, carbon capture, and other sectors. Okay. Um Korea participated in the Paris Climate Change Accord, then promised to reach the decarbon de decarbonization by uh, 2050. You know, uh, POSCO is also uh, promising to reach net zero carbon emission by 2050. You know, but the POSCO is producing still by using a blast furnace. A blast furnace method is a kind of a working based on the use of coal, which is Cause, which caused a lot of uh, carbon emissions. For, so for carbon net zero emissions by 2050, this kind of still making uh, production, method, still production method should not be uh, sustained uh, for our company. So POSCO is investing in the carbon reduction technology and by the development of technology by, for hydrogen re reduction uh, still making method, uh, which is, uh, it's very hard to explain, but anyway, for making still, uh, the, the, the oxygen should be, uh, reduced, uh, from the iron. And coal is a kind of a coal, uh, uh, coal is a kind of a carbon and carbon and oxygen, uh, get together and, CO2 uh, emission uh, will be created uh, by making mm -hmm. steel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we could use hydrogen uh, for reducing the oxygen. So this is a, a hydrogen reduction steel making method, but uh, which is a very initial stage in, the, in, the, in terms of the technology and uh, POSCO has the technology for that, but we need to develop and we need more research for that. And so, by the development of this kind of technology, POSCO will reach uh, net zero carbon emissions by uh, 2050. Uh, but the trans transformation of this kind of steel making method uh, from blast furnace method to 
uh, hydrogen uh, reduction steel making process. Uh, we need uh, a lot of huge R&D expenditure. And, uh, but this is a huge challenge for POSCO. So uh, we, need, uh, we need to find cost-effective hydrogen, and we need to find uh, more uh, cost-effective uh, renewable energy plays. And, but uh, this kind of transformation also provide uh, various kinds of uh, business opportunities. So business opportunities in the uh, green tech industries before reaching the level of hydrogen reduction steel making for net zero emissions, uh, the interim technology will be uh, for uh, carbon capture, storage, and utilization. Uh, POSCO is trying to invest in this, this kind of uh, technology and try to develop the uh, kind of a, a green, greener technology. But uh, this is a, a new business opportunities for uh, the POSCO, and I think that uh, Latin America, uh, South America, uh, could be the place for this kind of uh, a green technology. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Hopefully, you can green and decarbonize mm -hmm. those value chains in, in the region, and, and we, here we have a, a very strong platform for, for that. Talking about uh, sustainable investments, uh, Minister Paganini, um, your why stands out in the region in, 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 in that field. How can Korea and Uruguay do more and make the most out of that mutual interest in green technology? And please share with the audience some opportunities for cooperation and investment with, with Korea as Uruguay works towards increasing sustainability, especially in the transportation um, industry. Well, thank you. As I said before, we think of Uruguay as a country of innovation. And in the energy sector, we have, in a way, showed this. We, we delivered our first energy transformation very quickly, from 2010 to 2020, eliminating virtually all fossils from the generation of electricity through a very aggressive investment in wind power that was leveraging a lot of foreign direct investment. And now we're into the second transformation. And, and the second energy transformation has to deal with uh, still 40% of our energy that comes from fossils. And that is focused in transportation, as you said, and also in industry, cement making, for example, the examples that maybe has to get, take a relationship with POSCO. How do we achieve the decarbonization for 2050? Well, we have to invest heavily on in transforming our transportation with electric vehicles, but also with hydrogen. And when we come to hydrogen, we see that Uruguay is a country with much more availability of renewable sources and water and land than it would need for its own transformation. So, and the scale of the Uruguayan economy is small. So hydrogen has to be thought from the start as an export-oriented industry in Uruguay, where we think we have a very good opportunity because the world has to decarbonize the same as us, but also the world has to diversify as we are all talking about. So this, the countries in the south of South America that have a lot of renewable sources can be a supplier for economies that need this hydrogen. And this is a way to trans, trans, transport renewable electricity transformed into hydrogen, green hydrogen, to the demanding countries such as, for example, Korea. We have been working in that direction and we have already our national roadmap for hydrogen in place. And we have worked a lot with the European countries to study feasibility of producing and transporting hydrogen and its derivatives to Europe. We should go in the same direction with East Asia and specifically with Korea. So that's one of our main interests here is to think as Uruguay as a place where you can try, develop, but also make a big investment to grow as a supplier in the future hydrogen economy that the world needs to diversify its energy sources, to change the map of energy and also mainly for decarbonizing. Of course, there's a lot of 
work to be done. Direct reduction of iron, of course, needs uh, specifically something to be done, but new fuels derived from uh, renewable energy, renewable hydrogen, green hydrogen, combined with, for example, carbon from organic or biogenic origin, can be an alternative for shipping, for air, airline, fuel, airline transportation, and in a roadmap, this is the first stage, and we are already receiving in investment and interest in feasibility of these rather large-scale projects, pro, uh, projects that are aimed at exporting as well as the domestic market. And also green fertilizers that are an opportunity for the region, for the south of South America. I will not bore you very much, but I think it's a very good opportunity of complementarity between, between the south of the world and East Asia and Europe in this new hydrogen economy. Thank you, Minister. And undoubtedly, Uruguay and the region have a green surplus, and that green surplus is key to attract investment, to, to really transform it into a business opportunity, which leads me to Mr. Kim, to the question um, on, on the role of technology. And uh, Korea is, is a technology powerhouse, an innovator. Um, and what do you think, what role can technology play uh, when responding to these global challenges su such as climate change and supply change disruptions related to climate, and how can both regions continue to build on, on the high-tech synergies that, uh, that we're working on? And, you know, we have the, the IDB lab here, our manager of the IDB lab, which is our innovation laboratory, doing many things with, with her team. There's going to be workshops tomorrow, so we really uh, want to ask the audience to remain. This is not only a panel, not only a, a forum, it's a process. Um, so I wanted to also, uh, Irene, uh, recognize your presence here in the audience, but technology. Okay, thank you. Well, actually, I personally believe that this kind of prospect of technological kind of integration or technological synergy between these two economies are very bright. I believe so because actually these two economies are facing the same challenge, which is transition to clean economy. So why is it a challenge? Well, we already know that climate response is very important. But I'd like to emphasize that this is also a change, challenge, but it's also opportunity. Because we know that in the future, there will be more demand for electric vehicles and solar and kind of wind power and hydrogen, as you suggested. The interesting characteristic of this sector is that actually innovation matters in this sector, and there is a long supply chain. So in this regard, this transition to clean economy needs lots of technology. My belief is that these two economies are well positioned to work together in this regard, actually. Well, there are several cases. There are some Korean companies already participated in some solar panel projects in some Latin American companies and also energy grid. And actually, there are many Korean hydrogen companies which have an alliance. And they have some kind of proposal. And there are many Latin American companies who show some interest in joining this kind of thing. Because we know that the market for this clean energy and clean economies will grow in the future. So the question is, and all people agree with that, we need to respond it together and rapidly. And I think that these two countries are well positioned to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim. We, we share your, your passion and, and enthusiasm and optimism uh, for sure. Uh, Sebastian, you're going to have the, the last words here as everybody's hungry, wants to go to lunch, wants to keep networking and talking. Uh, the conversation continues, but coffee and data. You know, one doesn't think too much about coffee and digital, you know, in, in, in two different paths. How do those paths 
converge for Juan Valdez. How has di digitization transformed your value chain in Juan Valdez? Uh, and how does the company use data and technology uh, to anticipate or even mitigate supply chain disruptions? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Fabricio. Um, well, the, the technology has become you know, something that is so important to, to our organization. From the day that the pandemic, for example, was, um, uh, uh, you know, was declared, we started using technology in all ways, more than, you know, more than, you know, we used to do it. So we had, for example, we have 13, we, our, our coffee is in 39 countries from Asia to, to Ecuador to United States. So we have to rely on technology to continue with our, with our operations. So from video, uh, you know, technologies to, uh, <clears throat> to, you know, different technologies to help us to, uh, to continue with the, uh, you know, with our, with our operations. Um, technology is also <clears throat> playing an important role now, even more in, do, uh, within our organization. So now we have, and we are depending on BI <clears throat> technologies to be more, or to be more aligned, you know, all our um, uh, teams. And we understand exactly what's going on, not only with our operations, but what's going on in the, in, in the world in terms of coffee, uh, competitors, or in general, you know, what's going on with the, uh, uh, for example, with the supply chain. Now we have in real time, you know, some operations and we are, um, we are checking all, you know, these operations, what's going on, you know, in terms of sales, uh, uh, traffic to our stores and, and everything. So technology has played an important role. And in these two years, we have developed uh, technologies and we've been working with technologies that we may have, um, that we may not have, you know, been working in probably in five years. So in just a matter of, you know, a month, we develop technologies and we rely heavily on, on them. Um, <clears throat> in our back end, as I said, um, <clears throat> all the teams are well integrated. We have, um, um, we have offices in, well, uh, in, in Spain, in the in, in United States, we have offices in uh, in Ecuador, and uh, and to be to be aligned with them, we rely on, as I said, you know, on uh, on technology heavily. Um, so so it's not like uh, you know, coffee and technology is a different. Uh, you know, they don't uh, they don't go together. It's uh, it's something that uh, you know we we use we use on our day to day um, uh, nowadays. Innovation applied to every sector exactly. is the is the name of the game. So we really like to thank the panel. Undoubtedly, we see a lot of opportunities for the region, for the Korean audience that is here. We have many forums, many investment forums that we want you to come to Latin America. One coming up in Uruguay, test and invest in Uruguay, 4th and 5th of November. Invest in Jamaica in December. Uh, next year, an annual meeting, a very important investment forum for the services sector outsourced to Latin America and the Caribbean in Jamaica next year. So we publish all these events in, in our web pages in connectamericas.com. So please keep up and we We'd love to have you in the region to make those opportunities materialize and happen. So a round of applause for our great panel. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much to our moderator and our panelists for leading the session and joining our meaningful conversation. And ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our morning sessions, and we will begin the third session under the title of Confronting Climate Change, Coordinated Response to the Crisis. And now we'd we'll like to give you some announcements about luncheon. And ladies and gentlemen, please make your way to the Grand Ballroom 3 right beside this hall at your left side. And those who ask for special dietary, please move to the Grand Saloon right across the hall. So please enjoy your lunch and our uh, 
third plenary session will begin from 2 p.m. So please abide by this time and please enjoy your lunch. He comido bien. Muchas gracias.
And at this session, we will be talking about confronting climate change, coordinated response to the crisis. And at this time, we do have our panelists and a distinguished moderator joining us at this meaningful occasion. So now please allow me to introduce them. This session will be chaired by Mr. Won Kyung Cho, Professor and Director of Global University Industry Relations Center at the Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology. And next, uh, we'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. We're joined by Ms. Maria Alexandra Moreira Lopez, Secretary General at Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. Thank you. And we're also joined by Mr. Valentino Shell, a CEO of the Ministry of Rural Transformation, Community Development, Labor, and a Local Government of Belize. And we're also joined by Mr. Henry Gonzalez, Deputy Executive Director of the Green Climate Fund. We also have Mr. Ho Kyung Chong, a di Director for Climate Change and Carbon Neutral Policy of the Ministry of Environment of the Republic of Korea. Last but not least, Mr. Hyung Kyun Kwon, a Vice President of Green Business Investment Center at SK and Hydrogen Business Development Group at SKENS. So that was the introduction of our moderator and the panelists. And now I'd like to pass the microphone over to our moderator. If you're ready, please lead the session. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Wang Kyung Jo. Uh, I'm a uh, professor uh, uh, of uh, uni UNIST, Ulsan Institute of Science and Technology. I soy orgulloso de trabajar. I have great pride in the fact that I had the opportunity to work at IDB. Well, Korea's uh, membership to the IDB in, in 2005. Uh, after that, I worked for the IDB twice. Uh, and um, the memory uh, a little bit cherished in my heart. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, today uh, um, as a role of a moderator. Uh, uh, this session is uh, for confronting uh, climate change, coordinated uh, response to the crisis. Yeah, we have to uh, we have to uh, um, give coordinate uh, efforts uh, to overcome um, climate disaster. So, uh, so we have. Uh, Keynote uh, presentation. Uh, uh, keynote presenter. Uh, his name is uh, Ben uh, Ben Lopez uh, Benitez. Uh, sorry for my bad, uh, bad pronunciation. Yeah, he is uh, uh, vice president for sectors and knowledge in the American Development Bank. Uh, so. Uh, 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 we can give him the floor for, uh, for presentation. Benigno Lopez uh, Benitez. Hmm? He's not here at the moment. Okay. Uh, my, uh, uh the you know uh, the impact and response to climate change is a urgent uh, critical and a global matter uh, have you read uh, the book uh, how to avoid uh, climate just uh, uh, written by uh, Bill Gates mm, so uh, I was very impressed by his book and uh, I remember five pillars uh, uh, for climate and change. Um, so uh, we know how to uh, solve uh, this problem, but uh, it's a long way to go. And uh, after uh, the U.S. President uh, uh, Joe Biden is 
uh, erected, uh, <coughs> elected, uh, sorry, elected uh, uh, he, his first uh, promise was uh, uh, to return to uh, Paris Agreement. And we, now we, we have a uh, uh, carbon neutral by 20, uh, uh, 50, um, and having said that, we have, uh, uh, you know, each country's uh, effort, U.S. Uh, Green Deal, Green New Deal, and uh, uh, Euro Green New Deal, a uh, Green Deal, and now uh, Euro uh, is trying to give uh, give a policy called re re repower uh, uh, Europe, and we witnessed the uh, current uh, uh, law in. U.S. Uh, the the name is uh, I don't know the exact the full name, full name I mean Inflation Reduction Act something like that right and so uh, we focus on renewable energy and wind and solar uh, power and to also give a, 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 a tax credit uh, to uh, when you buy a uh, uh, buy a uh, cars, um, and we have uh, many many uh, important instruments of, to uh, reduce uh, crime, uh, carbon emissions. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, one week ago. Uh, uh, there was a very uh, famous uh, conference, uh, uh, which was held uh, uh, in Seoul. Um, it's it, it's uh, one of the topic was uh, climate disaster, and we uh, and they uh, they uh, invited many uh, specialists uh, uh, in the area of uh, climate uh, change. Um, I, I attended one session uh, which deals with uh, uh, direct air capturing, and it's a uh, uh, minus. I mean, uh, carbon neutral, and uh, one is positive and one is minus. And we, when we plant uh, trees, that might, that means minus. And, uh, so when you when you a plant a tree, you contribute, uh, you contribute to uh, the, the reduction of climate, uh, uh, the reduction of uh, car carbon emissions. Yeah. Hmm? He's not here. Okay. Uh, so when I dealt with uh, the topic, uh, many years ago, uh, when I was in uh, IDB, we focused on carbon, uh, uh, climate uh, adap change, adaptation, and mitigation. That was a uh, older story, but it's still effective. Yeah, and now we are more practical we are more practical <clears throat> and uh, we see a uh, we witness uh, many uh, environment friendly uh, cars uh, running on the street uh, uh, compared to other countries uh, in Korea we have uh, 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 P Pure cell electric car. And do you want to uh, light the uh, <laughs> um, pure cell uh, electric car called uh, um, 
you know, which was made, I, I, I forgot the name, <laughs> and which was made by Hyundai, um, like so, I'm sorry, like so. Um, uh, and uh, Korea is not very a, a appropriate uh, place for uh, solar energy and uh, but uh, uh, when I was a uh, uh, vice mayor of uh, Ulsan, uh, we tried to establish the world's largest uh, offshore wind farm, um, uh, floating offshore uh, uh, wind farm. And, but at the moment, uh, 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 it's p pending, but uh, we, but uh, in the end, uh, we will uh, 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 finish uh, that project uh, uh, in due time. <clears throat> uh, many years ago, uh, uh, we have a president, uh, he uh, his uh, nickname was a part of uh, green uh, growth, and uh, after that, uh, the the President Moon, uh, uh, you know, uh, was very very uh, uh, interested in uh, accelerating um, carbon uh, uh, emission reduction. Mm. Now uh, we have a practical agenda uh, on how to how to cope with uh, uh, climate uh, uh, change in a uh, <clears throat> in a practical manner. And if I introduce uh, Korea New Deal, uh, which was launched in July. 2020 and updated in 2021, uh, uh, that uh, policy a aims to transform the Korean uh, post-pandemic economy, embracing a green digital economy as well as uh, strengthening the social safety net to support the transition. The Green New Deal component in includes investments in green infrastructure, including establishing zero energy and public facilities, restoring ecosystems, and building water management systems, low carbon and decentralized energy, including um, building a smart grid, and promoting uh, renewable energy use, and expanding uh, supply of uh, electric and hydrogen vehicles. Innovation in green industry, including promoting um, green businesses, establishing green industrial complexes, and supporting um, green innovation through uh, uh, R&D and the financial sector. Yeah, carbon neutrality, uh, supporting achievement uh, uh, of the 23 nationally determined contribution through emissions measurement and reduction for industries. Uh, speaking of NDC, uh, we have a very ambitious goal on 40% uh, uh, reduction uh, um, by 23. Uh, uh, the, ba the base year, uh, it might be uh, 2018 uh, compared to 20. 18, uh, we will uh, reduce carbon emissions uh, uh, 40 percent uh, by 2030. Uh, within that goal, uh, we have uh, uh, various uh, means uh, to uh, cope with the uh, uh, climate uh, change. And about you know. In, in the past, uh, we, we thought climate change is just a, a, a matter of uh, uh, overcoming 
uh, a matter of uh, uh, <clears throat> to be overcome uh, to save uh, the earth, the only earth. But now uh, it is uh, becoming um, a very important industry in each country. Uh, in Korea, uh, uh, the battery industry is growing um, bigger and bigger. Um, with China, uh, Korean uh, battery companies are uh, spearheading uh, to uh, support uh, uh, electric and vehicle. And we, we have also very much interest in uh, establishing uh, uh, hydrogen uh, town. Uh, if you are very much interested in that, you can visit uh, uh, my place. Uh, yeah. So uh, I want uh, Maria Alexandra uh, uh, Morelia Lopez uh, mm, to speak something regarding this. Or uh, if you want, uh, can I give you a question? Uh, okay. Uh, how is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very much interested in the Amazon region. You know, how is the Amazon region working and integrating climate change into uh, its uh, work agenda? Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation for, to the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. If you allow me, I will speak in Spanish. Bueno, eh, cuando más complicado, toda vez que el IPCC ya no se... So when we discuss the climate change in the Amazon region, I can say that this is a very complex challenge because the global average temperature they say that it has climbed one degree, two degrees, but in fact, when this is translated to the Amazon region, it is much worse because I understand that it, we've already increased the global temperatures in the Amazon regions by 1.2 degrees. And right now we are living in a situation, the reality is that it is in fact about 1.5 degrees. And so this means that the glaciers are in severe a crisis. This ultimately means that the people, the residents living in the Amazon region will suffer severe bipolarization when it comes to the food crisis, when it comes to the energy crisis. And so we can say that uh, climate change is the core of all government policy. Many people think that there are no people living in the Amazon region, but there are about 34 million people uh, living in Amazon. In fact, there are many different uh, ethnicities and indigenous uh, tribes that are living there, and many of them even go to work in the cities that are neighboring the surrounding Amazon region. So we need to supply them with the necessary water resources and also deal with the processing of solid waste. And these are all issues that we really have to consider uh, very much. That is why there are eight countries right now, Bolivia, Ecuador, Guyana, Venezuela, uh, Venezuela, Suriname, that are part of our treaty organization, which we established together in 1978. This is a way for us to look both in terms of political partnership, uh, technological cooperation, and funding. This Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization can lead to helping biodiversity, water resources, forestry, 
and the public policies regarding these issues and also health care and different policies for the indigenous communities in the Amazon region. In fact, our organization oversees all of these different efforts. However, we play a role not just for the eight member countries, but we must play a role for the entire world because the forests and the rainforest, particularly in the Amazon region, if they are degraded, they are encompassing about 1 billion cubic meters of uh, carbon emissions effect. And so if these rainforests, if the Amazon rainforests are degraded, then we will not benefit from uh, this carbon offset. If we were to deteriorate the 10,000 or so uh, cubic meters of Amazon, then this is uh, would be almost like offsetting the entire efforts of the European continent. This means that when it comes to biodiversity and water resources of the Amazon region, it is economically feasible for us. It is much more beneficial for us to conserve these resources in the Amazon region. That is why in all of the different working programs that we are implementing, especially the cooperative programs that we are carrying out in the Amazon region, we are very active in these efforts so that our economy can be more competitive. Thank you, Maria. Uh, uh, after uh, listening uh, uh, your presentation, uh, I was very impressed uh, uh, by uh, your uh, <coughs> the effort for uh, preserving um, the Amazon region. Um, it, yeah, uh, ch challenging um, uh, Amazon region will, uh, will scale up uh, carbon emissions reduction. And now next, uh, I'll give a, a floor to Valentino uh, Shal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you expect uh, uh, addressing the climate change can contribute to the economic, economic recovery? How is Belize uh, positioning itself to benefit from the green economy? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, um, Professor. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here to speak on this topic for a small country like Belize. Um, I am very certain that I am representing the smallest country and the smallest economy in this room today um, from, from Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, but even though uh, we are very small, uh, we are already facing severe effects of climate change, which is why it is important that uh, gatherings such as this address this very important topic. As it is right now, um, the loss and damage from extreme weather events cost, is costing Belize about 4% of its GDP annually on average. And so, we are currently faced with that now. Um, we are also trying to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, which devastated the economy. Uh, our economy is very dependent on tourism. And, um, and so overnight, tourism went from a, a very important part of the economy to, to zero. And so that, that took away about 16% of, of GDP for us. So here we are now, we're trying to recover from the effects of COVID-19. And we also have to um, recover and keep, keep uh, fighting the, the effects of climate change in, in, in our economy. Um, we, we have no choice, but we have to keep growing the economy. Uh, and at the same time, keep adapting to climate change. Uh, for a small economy like Belize, a, we are trying to invest and, and, and grow the economy, a, not just in a way that helps to build resilience to climate change, but economic growth itself helps a small country like Belize 
to act as an insurance um, from the effects of climate change. If we have a stronger and more resilient economy, we are then able to withstand the, the effects um, that, that we're faced with. No? Uh, at the same time, um, investing in, in the economy and investing in climate adaptation helps to address uh, economic and social issues. And so um, this is something that, that we, keep we keep working on. Um, for us in Belize, climate change is through storms, drought, flooding, um, is affecting our agroproductive sector and of course our infrastructure. Those are the two main areas we see the effects um, taking place. So as a result, we are investing in improving our road networks. Um, and so while this investment is, is beneficial uh, in terms of our climate adaptation, it also helps us to increase our economic productivity and efficiency in moving goods um, and products uh, to the market, both internally and, and externally. You know? Similarly, in, in the area of agriculture, we are very, after tourism, our economy is very dependent on agriculture. And so because of this dependence and because of the importance of agriculture to food security, uh, we are also investing significantly in climate smart agriculture uh, and expanding sustainable agricultural practices using available technologies such as more efficient irrigation, cover structures, water harvesting, agroforestry, and, 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 and so on. Uh, this climate smart agriculture approach not only increases economic efficiency in production, but also uh, has the benefit of reducing the cost of production and post-harvest losses all at the same time. So not only is this good for our exports, it's also good for the environment, it's good for the economy, it uh, increases job opportunities and income for, for, for Belizeans. No? And so how are we position, positioning ourselves to benefit from the green economy? Well, there are a couple things I'd, I'd like to share. Um, three things. One is, uh, in order for us to benefit from, from the green economy, uh, Belize is developing very appropriate policies to, to support the transition. We have, for instance, um, developed a low emissions development strategy for the first time. We have revised our national determined contributions. Um, and we are currently working on a green and blue economy industrial strategy in, in order to look at regulatory reforms, incentives and subsidies, technological innovations and market regulation. Our, our plan is our, to be a leader in incorporating new green technologies to drive our national competitiveness and growth. Secondly, we are um, developing appropriate legislation to transition into the new economy. At the moment, we are preparing uh, a new carbon credit legislation to establish a framework to manage and regulate the carbon credit market. Um, we, we do have a significant portion of our country in forest reserves. So we do have uh, um, significant carbon sequestration capabilities as a country, uh, but we don't yet have the laws to manage this, this new market. And so this is one of the reasons why we're developing this legislation. Um, and the second uh, part of, of preparing the legislative framework to, to adjust is um, improving the legislative framework for digitalization. And this morning I heard quite a bit of digitalization and this is extremely important for small economies in the Caribbean especially, because it really increases the efficiency in terms of government services, but also for the private sector and uh, business transactions. And so in order to prepare our, our country for this, uh, we this year we have passed uh, new legislation that allows a digital transactions to be legal, um, ensuring the, the safety of, of data, and of course, uh, ensuring that there are judicial protection for, for this type of information. No? And of course, we're also doing um, several institutional changes to finance the reforms that, that we need uh, and, and to carry out the investments in the green economy. Um, we recently created a climate finance unit within the Ministry of Economic Development, and we are working uh, very diligently uh, with, for instance, with um, 
international partners like the Green Climate Fund uh, to access concessionary loans to finance these new investments in the new green economy. So these are some of the ways that uh, Belize is positioning itself, preparing itself for the future, and at the same time uh, looking at um, ensuring that the country and the economy is uh, adapting to climate change. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paris is positioning uh, for climate uh, to, to adapt to and mitigate uh, climate change is very timely and appropriate. And, uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the scheme of a new carbon registra registration is very uh, impressive. Uh, digitalization is also very important for uh, energy efficiency and Access, accessible fund will help uh, this country to uh, cope with uh, climate change. And uh, uh, we, 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 we believe uh, uh, Belize's efforts will uh, be very helpful uh, to recover economy. And now we have uh, Henny Gonzalez. Uh, yeah, I'll give a mic. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much to the Inter-American Development Bank and the other sponsors for inviting us here in this important event. Um, after listening to Maria Alexandra and to Valentino, I think it makes quite a compelling story of why the Green Climate Fund was created. We want to make sure that we preserve and that we support countries as they face uh, the, you know, consequences of climate change without being the emitters or without being the ones causing the issues. And at the same time, we do have vulnerable countries uh, like Belize that requires innovation and requires ways into engaging. The Green Climate Fund was founded within the uh, UN Convention on Climate Change with the purpose of becoming a financing mechanism to help countries uh, in their climate action ambitions and also in a way of using capital in the most creative way to hopefully crowding other investors. We were founded um, in 2012, so we've been operating for about 10 years, but we actually became operational after the COP21 in Paris. When in Paris, it was very clear that we were going to be one of the most important funding mechanisms. We currently have already invested in 200 projects globally, and we have committed $10.8 billion, and we've been able to crowd in another $30 billion. So we have a portfolio between our own commitment and co-financing of about $40 billion. And while it is indeed a large amount, this only represents 2 to 3% of the capital that is needed. We know that on a yearly basis, countries require somewhere between two and four trillion dollars to make uh, to make up and face the consequences of climate change. So the Green Climate Fund, um, as it is uh, funded by donor countries, wants to be a true catalyzer. We want to make sure that our limited public funding is used in a smart way to crowd in private capital, and specifically from the private sector. We work through partners like the Inter-American Development Bank, like CABE, the Central American Bank for Integration, and we also work with other partners of the private sector, like asset managers, commercial banks, or private equity funds. So we are capital agnostic. We are here to provide the whole toolkit of capital from grants to loans, to guarantees, to private equity, blue bonds, green bonds, any capital that is required, we are able to provide it. And the way we work is that we, wear, we work very closely through countries like Belize, because our goal is to support countries in turning their national determined contributions into investable plans that would allow them to uh, face these challenges. We have made investments in Latin America in all sectors. We have recently, or we are going to be approving a project in the next board meeting on e-mobility, as the professor 
uh, was mentioning. E-mobility is becoming indeed an important area. We have also worked a lot in mitigation and adaptation. Our fund has a goal of having a balance of 50% of our grant equivalency funding goes into mitigation and the other 50% into adaptation. We're working a lot in resilient agriculture. We're working a lot in resilient infrastructure. We recently approved a project that is extremely innovative because it's working in protecting the coral reefs uh, of the different small island development states in order to make sure that the, that the reef is protected and it has less stressors than what it has received through uh, responsible tourism and through better ways of using our resources. So we believe that the theme of this panel is about a concerted effort in facing climate change. We are here as a conduit, as a hub of the climate architecture to support countries to support the private sector, but most importantly, to make sure that the green growth agenda is human-centered. We are here to support those that are most vulnerable, especially indigenous communities, women, and other groups that are underrepresented, and we would like to make sure that our funding helps those uh, countries and those uh, populations, um, you know, help them come out of this in a way that is long-term oriented and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Hen Henny Gonzalez. Uh, yeah, after listening to him, uh, we uh, recognized uh, IDB's uh, pivotal role uh, to better mobilize uh, financial contributions from the private sector to support to the colonization, uh, particularly across borders. Um, I'm also uh, sure you know, there are many uh, compelling and profitable climate smart investment opportunities uh, in the region, right? Yeah. And now we have uh, Ho Gyeong Jong, and he uh, he's. Yeah, he is Director for Climate Change in International Cooperation Team, Minister of Environment of Korea. And I have one question. Um, why why uh, is intervention on climate change, uh, why, why is uh, intervention in the area of uh, climate uh, change is uh, urgent, uh, urgently, uh, ur urgently needed. Uh, addressing the compounding effects of climate uh, change with the COVID-19 on poverty, food uh, insecurity, and inequality. Yeah, so then yeah, my question is uh, to address this uh, part. Why uh, is uh, intervention in climate change climate change needed, yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good question. Uh, yes, thank you very much. My name is Ho Kyung Jung, Director for Climate Change and Carbon Neutral Policy. And today it is a pleasure for me to be able to participate in this important forum to talk about this important venue. It's an important opportunity to talk with our partners from the Lab Nations. Have you seen the movie Interstellar? It talks about the food crisis uh, that has occurred because of the climate crisis. Uh, the food crisis was not solved, uh, even with technology. And so in that movie, you can see that most people engage in corn farming. But uh, still, that could not solve the food issue. And so the people leave Earth to find new sources of food. Of course, this is fiction, but we have seen throughout uh, the history of mankind, sim a similar incident. that ta This takes us back to 250 million years ago. And this was a time when there was total extinction of all of, well, almost all of the uh, life forms of life on the earth, 96% went extinct. People think, what happened at that time? Was it because of the freezing of the temperature or did earth crash into a 
another uh, planet. Well, actually, what happened was because there was a massive change in the climate. There was an explosion of a volcano, and all of the coals were burnt at that time. And there was massive amount of CO2 that filled the air, that led to massive climate change, and that led to the mass extinction of all living creatures. Almost all living creatures on Earth. So I do believe that if we look back at the history of mankind, there were similar incidents, and also we saw a similar story taking place in this fictional movie. But what about today? In reality, if you look at the statistics, after the Industrial Revolution, half of the CO2 in the air has been emitted due to human actions in the past thirty years. And if you look at the speed of emission, that it is ten times faster than the emission speed that took place 250 million years ago, and so. We have to be concerned, especially about the lack of food, the food crisis that may emerge, as we saw in that movie, Interstellar. So the harvest amount can go down by ten percent if we do not take action. And as you know, the population of the world continues to grow. We see the shortening of food and also the increase of population, which can lead to a massive disaster on the planet Earth. Also, according to FAO of the UN, the Crop、uh, growing takes place in Chile, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay in the Lac Islands, and there was statistics found for this region. The annual crop、uh, growth. Has dropped、uh, considerably over the years on an annual basis, and in the case of Chile, there was massive drought that has、uh, hurt the country. This is one of the most severe droughts that mankind has experienced in the past 1,000 years. Also, we can think about a future of more frequent pandemics, pandemics, pandemics like COVID-19. This is because as the temperature goes up, viruses and also、uh, other germs can more easily spread. According to the World Bank, by 2030. 3.6 billion or more of the population will be exposed to the risk of malaria. And also in Europe this summer, there was massive heat waves. The people that live in the cities had to endure such devastating heat, which will lead to greater fatality. And on top of this, the food, water shortage will worsen. So our near future may seem like a scene in the movie Interstellar. So these are grim prospects for mankind. What does this imply for us? The Pope, Pope Francis, said the following words: In 2015, he had said that God. Always forgives. Humans sometimes forgive. However, nature never forgives. So, ladies and gentlemen, the extreme weather patterns that we are witnessing today, perhaps, may be the result of nature taking fury against mankind because nature does not forgive. And mankind, we are, have always acknowledged this. So, with the COP three. Since then, we have come up with the Kyoto Protocol, as you know. At that time, the nations of the world gathered together to gather wisdom, to find solutions to overcome climate change. We studied together, and we started to take action. And also, there were countries that were mandated to cut their emissions. And various tools have been implemented and developed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But we have realized. Uh, soon enough, that we need more effective measures as the temperature continue to rise and emissions continue to grow, and so we came up with the Paris Agreement in 2015. Since then, detailed action plans have been implemented. Well, we've concluded and agreed on this new framework at the Paris. Agreement、uh, conference, the COP, and this year the COP will be held in Egypt. COP twenty-seven will be held, and I do believe that the topic 
for COP27 would be, how we can realistically implement these action plans. And also, for the lack countries, adaptation being effectively implemented will be a major topic. As you all know, increasingly, international cooperation related to cr climate change will have to be strengthened. However, implementation will be very important for us to stop climate change. Korea is making efforts to contribute to stopping climate change, and we share this understanding with the LAC countries, and that is why we have engaged in many co-projects with the nations of the LAC region. I do believe that f such cooperation will continue to be promoted. LAC and Korea However, I think we can do more together uh, in the field of environment, as it was mentioned before, for example, waste and circular economy and also technology for tackling climate change and also the exchange of knowledge. I think that many efforts have been made, but I think that the Korean government, including the Ministry of Environment, had to think about more opportunities that can be mutually beneficial for both regions so that we can further promote mutual cooperation. I think that this is like a chain. So the strength of the chain, well, the weakest uh, connection part, if that part breaks, then the chain will no longer persist. So we have to focus on the weakest parts. And when we respond to the issue of climate change, we have to work together to strengthen all parts to ensure that there is no weakness part, weak parts. I do hope that we can continue to closely work with the countries of LAC so that we can indeed strengthen all of the chains connecting this overall chain. Uh, we need it, uh, uh, if, if not, uh uh, the nature will warm, and we you know uh, the uh, uh, wrath of uh, nature. Uh, and you know, uh, Bill Gates uh, 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 emphasized the next pandemic. Uh, and and do you know Jeremy Ripkin? And he's uh, he advocates uh, hydrogen economy, and he also mentioned uh, COVID nineteen is a uh, uh, cause of uh, this pandemic. Yeah, in that sense, uh, we need to uh, focus on uh, focus on detailed implementation for international cooperation in the area of uh, uh, climate and change. Yeah. Okay, and now we have uh, Hyungwon Kwon, uh, Vice President of the Green Business Investment Center, uh, SK Incorporation and the Hydrogen Business Development Group, SK ENS. And I have a question. Uh, uh, do you find a possible return on investment f uh, from sustainable investments? What would the, what uh, will encourage more uh, private sector investment? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Andrew Kwan. Uh, currently working for SK Inc., uh, which is the second largest conglomerate in South Korea. Um, uh, before we go for the question uh, and answer, uh, I, it is my privilege and honor to uh, represent SK. Uh, SK is targeting uh, to reduce uh, carbon emission of 200 million tons by 2030 and 2030, 2030, uh, which is uh, equivalent to 1% contribution of the global uh, reduction. Uh, in this regard, uh, we are actively investing in uh, many areas, such as uh, uh, green hydrogen and pure cell and electrolyzers, and also the small modular reactor and uh, energy solution area. So uh, by doing so, just um, by doing so, we can contribute 1% carbon reduction by 2030. Uh, that is the, our uh, SK's target uh, for the uh, green investments uh, sector. Uh, the back to the question, uh, 
I believe um, many energy companies uh, have made uh, some solid and stable uh, margin uh, from the investment into the renewables. Uh, I think uh, the decades ago, uh, it was very hard to make a profit uh, from that investment. However, just uh, uh, due to the many regions, uh, such as the economies of scale and the technology development and uh, some other, et cetera, uh, so just uh, uh, we the labelized cost of uh, uh, energy from the uh, solar and uh, wind uh, has been decreased uh, significantly for a decade. So uh, we can make a profit. Uh, however, just um, among those regions, such as uh, economies of scale and technology development and etc., cetera, uh, economies of scale, I believe, e economies of scale is very crucial uh, for make a profit. So I think uh, the, the government uh, should provide some support to create uh, economies of scale, uh, such as uh, large demand uh, from the uh, public sector or uh, private sector. So, uh, for example, uh, the SK is developing hydrogen uh, in South Korea. Uh, we, can, we can produce uh, uh, green hydrogen or blue hydrogen by ourselves. However, uh, it is very hard to uh, make uh, uh, create the demand by ourselves. So, uh, it requires uh, some subsidy or incentive uh, for the customers uh, to adopt uh, the hydrogen, uh, which is uh, yeah, relatively expensive uh, compared to other uh, energy resources. I think uh, just by doing so, just we can make a profit in the short run, and then just uh, afterward, uh, the private sector uh, can make a profit uh, from the economies of scale and uh, some uh, effort uh, to make a uh, technology development. Um, just I, I want to add one comment. Uh, Maybe uh, many countries or many sec many uh, companies uh, doubt uh, the why the private sector focuses on the uh, green investment, uh, green energy sector or energy transition. Uh, and there is some question, the, especially in South Korea, uh, which are highly dependent on coal or natural gas. Uh, Maybe just a private sector, comp private company uh, have uh, some challenges to make energy transition. So it, it makes uh, some loss in the, in the future. However, just SK uh, as a conglomerate and energy company, the biggest uh, energy company in South Korea, uh, we think the energy transition into the sustainable, sustainable energy uh, is uh, we regard that uh, is a chance, uh, not a challenge, because just uh, you know, just some we in the in the field uh, we realize that a lot of customers or a lot of clients, such as Google or Amazon or like Walmart, they prefer to buy uh, the product from the company which use renewable energies or clean energies. So just we think energy transition is a chance, uh, not a challenge. So just uh, we can make a profit uh, from this investment. Okay. Okay, uh, we, we live in the era of energy security and uh, energy transition. Um, we noted SK's effort, efforts to clean uh, this uh, uh, environment uh, and this earth. And green hydrogen is the ultimate goal in the area of a hydrogen economy with the advanced technology. Uh, within uh, the constraint of uh, time, time constraint, uh, now I uh, have to declare that the session will be closed. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to throw many questions, but uh, Time is up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much once again, and thank you to all of our panelists. And please return to your seats.
Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. Thank you very much for your talk on our third plenary session. Thank you very much for your participation. And ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to start our last session of the day. It will be our last session, fourth session entitled Embracing a Digital Transformation Strategy for Going Digital. So before we begin our session, we would like to have our moderator and panelists onto the stage. So please come up to the stage. for your kind cooperation. Thank you. Um,
Thank you very much for your participation until the very last moment of our forum. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce our moderator and panelists. And this time, we're joined by Mr. Miguel Angel Purua, e-government principal specialist, data and digital government cluster coordinator at the Innovation in Citizen Services Division at the Inter-American Development Bank. And he will be leading this session. And we're also joined by distinguished panelists. First of all, we're joined by Ms. Maria Luisa Ayem, Minister of Economy of El Salvador. We're also joined by Mr. Diego Bertesolo, co-founder and CEO at Avangargo. And we also have Mr. Jorge de Leon Yanis, a commercial coordinator of digital transformation at Teisa Paraguay. And Dr. Hoyer Kwan, president of the Korea Information Society Development Institute, is also joining us. And last but not least, Ms. Ji Yun Son, head of government affairs at Naver Corporation, is also joining us here at the site. So, ladies and gentlemen, now please welcome our moderator and panelist with a big round of applause. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, uh, kind of closing, I would say probably golden closing uh, of uh, a very interesting journey, I would say. And uh, for those of you that may feel uh, like uh, some napping time, I uh, encourage you not to do so for two reasons. One is, have you heard about IoT, Internet of Things? Okay, well, there is sensors everywhere. Anyone that closes the eyes will be forecast worldwide. Your bosses will see it, your wives, husbands. <laughs> no, but that, that's not the reason. The reason is but because we have uh, a very interesting panel, a very uh, rich, uh, diverse experience and points of view from private sector, from government, from research institutions. So uh, I'm sure it's going to be an interesting exchange. Uh, I have to say uh, that I, I'm truly privileged to be moderating this panel. And this time, the privilege comes with uh, affection also, because for those uh, interesting things in life, a uh, time ago, I was a colleague of Minister Maria Luisa, Minister of Economy of El Salvador, that used to work at, at the IDB. So it's one of those privileges in life, working with talented colleagues. So happy to share the stage with you, Minister. And I was also a colleague of uh, Ms. Jijun Son that used to work with us on digital matters at the bank some years ago, right, uh, Jijun? So if, if you uh, see me treating with uh, extra familiarity, the panel is just out of the highest respect to all of them, but out of affection as well. And uh, the fact that Jijun um, works with us with, with, with us at the bank, uh, I think it makes me say that uh, the value of, of the Korea partnership for the bank is immense, as we've seen this, this day and we'll see tomorrow in terms of the sharing of knowledge and, and the financial support as well. And uh, uh, having talented people like Jijun working for us has also been one of the great contributions that Korea has done to the bank and to the region. We've been very fortunate, uh, Bernardo knows it well, with the talent that Korea has lent to the bank. So thank you, uh, Korea, government of Korea and all the Koreans. Let me, uh, we'll, we'll go to the panel in two minutes, promise. But, but let me give you some context on uh, why it is important that in uh, LAC Korea Business Summit, we devote some time to digital transformation. And uh, I have to say thank you to my colleagues in the integration department to saving some time for digital transformation. In fact, those of us that have been listening during the day, every eight or 10 minutes, the word digital came up, right? There's probably nothing you can do, be it uh, climate change fight fighting or employment generation or, or, or fiscal uh, matters sort out. You need digital transformation nowadays. Let me give you a couple of figures that uh, 
illustrate the relevance of being here, having this exchange about digital transformation. The digital transformation business reached about 600 billion worldwide uh, in 2021, which means tons of opportunities for Korean and Latin American companies. But also e-commerce reached four trillion dollars uh, last year, meaning that most of or, or a lot of the economic activity happens in these platforms in the digital world. In the case of Latin America, it went below uh, above uh, 100 billion last year, 100 billion. Just during COVID time, 56 million Latin American and Caribbeans that have never done e-commerce have done it. So it's, it's a growing trend. Now, uh, those policies uh, need a strong public sector that leads, that leads those uh, digital transformation policies, as is the case in, in Korea. I mean, Korea owes a lot to its progress in digital to the right government policies, as we know. And by the way, today was launched the United Nations Digital Government Report. As usual, uh, Korea is uh, well placed in the picture. It is in third position and it has been top three since the index exists 20 years ago. So if there is a good country to talk about what we are talking uh, is Korea. In the case of Latin America, the last 30 seconds, just to say, we've done progress. We've done some progress, and probably the minister will illustrate us. Uh, there's, there's many things. Brazil has, uh, for instance, electronic invoicing, invoicing that has reduced informality by 3% and increased revenues by 10%. We have a country like Uruguay that has 95% of government procedures online and is uh, at number 35 worldwide. You know? We have Jamaica that has integrated all customs procedures in, in one in one-stop uh, one shop, saving uh, more than 30 days to companies. So there's things that, that have progressed, but, but we still have out of 32 countries, 15 that do not have a digital strategy at all. We have just 13 countries that have a cybersecurity strategy. We have just seven countries that have digital identity out of 32. This is to say that we have a long road ahead of us. And for that to advance quicker, we need to learn from countries like Korea. And that's why we're here. And that's why we're thankful to have this exchange. So without further delay, let me start uh, with you, Minister, dear Maria Luisa. Um, one of the things that came up during the day is uh, inclusion. Huh? And one of the risks of the digital agenda is to exclude some. What can be done to make El Salvador's digital transition more inclusive for women, for youth, for rural, for vulnerable groups in general? What can be done, Minister? No, you have to... There you go, technology. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the IDB and the organizers of this event for having us here. We believe these uh, kind of events are very, very important in order to strengthen our relationships, the relationship of Latin America uh, and Korea, and gives us also an opportunity to share uh, the different experiences that we're going through. Uh, in, in our different countries. I am very honored to be here this, this afternoon and, and be able to represent the government of El Salvador, a government uh, that is completely certain that by the use of the technology, we're not gonna not only be able to transform uh, the lives of our citizens in a very short period of time, but we're gonna set the ground for a sustainable economic growth. Uh, everything and inclusive, of course, uh, everything that we do uh, within the government, uh, we, we're always asking the question, are we, are we innovating? Are we adopting technologies in order to make sure that we have uh, the greatest impact? And we, we, we believe that ha by having this approach, a country uh, that had an stagnated economic growth, a country that didn't have the, the right business environment, the country that was not innovating El Salvador uh, is shortly uh, and soon it's gonna become a much more developed country. Uh, as of today, El Salvador is, is showing a, a, a very positive performance in its economic growth and exports, investment. Every data that we look at 
it's uh, the level of employment. And even though we have gone through a very tough times because of uh, COVID-19 and, and the high levels of inflation, high, high prices of, of oil, even though uh, ev all this is going on, fortunately, uh, we can say that El Salvador, in it, it's in its best moments uh, in, it, in, in terms of its economic performance. And in order to achieve the highest uh, positive impact for our population, and in order to make sure that everyone benefits uh, from the power of innovation and the power of new technologies, we have taken a holistic approach in terms of bringing uh, our population into the, the, the technology training. And since very, very early stages until uh, the high school levels and higher education, uh, we are making sure that uh, the population has the right the right skills and the right uh, hardware in order to uh, make sure that there is that contact with technology and that we are trained in technology so that we can all benefit uh, from it. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, uh, we are going through a very important reform in El, in El Salvador's education uh, education uh, system. Uh, we have also provided uh, so that we have the, the right training uh, for our, our young population, uh, but we have also provided computers, tablets uh, to our youth. And something very, uh, an area where we have put a lot, a lot of emphasis is in that population that uh, unfortunately doesn't have a job and uh, maybe they couldn't afford going to uh, to higher education. Uh, we are, uh, within the Ministry of Economy, we're implementing various projects uh, where together with big uh, technolo technology multinational companies, we're providing training in technol te technological skills. Uh, this is focused in men and women, of course, because we believe that more and more uh, there should be more e equality in the access to uh, technology education. Uh, we have also created a Tech Skills Council, thanks to the support of the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, where the companies, the, the, the technology companies that are growing, are identifying what is the skills, what are the, what are the skills that technology companies need today and in the future, and working together with the government, uh, we are implementing uh, projects, uh, sustainable projects, to make sure that uh, these population that before didn't have a, any alternatives for growth, uh, now they have uh, alternatives no matter where they are. And this is where inclusi uh, the inclusiveness component comes, because the approach that we're taking through an alliance with 25 higher universe, uh, uh, higher education institutions and technical, technical institutions, technical studies institution is, uh, we're bringing the technology skills training everywhere in the country. So these measures complement, uh, to providing youth with, with a computer, uh, also to those, uh, uh, measures that we're taking so that there is, uh, internet throughout the entire country. So, uh, just to, to, to close, because I know uh, we don't have uh, much time, it's important to have a, a, a holistic approach in order uh, to make sure that we get the most uh, benefits of adoptions of, of, of technology. Thank you, Minister. And in fact, another project focuses on connectivity. We're about, you are about to start a, a, a big project focused on connectivity, an IDB project, interestingly enough, co-funded by the government of Korea to the tune of $80 million, focus on connectivity, right, Minister? Yeah, so the, the commitment of this government is to make sure that in every corner in, in El Salvador, there is uh, the, the right connectivity, uh, the right quality, and, and also uh, this is very, very important because we're promoting and we're working towards uh, becoming a, a technological a technology hub in, in El Salvador. So we need the right telecommunication services throughout, uh, throughout uh, the entire country. Uh, this is how we see uh, that we're going to bring development to every single corner in El Salvador. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we're moving now to the private sector. That's why we have this variety and reach of experiences. Diego, you uh, represent Avancargo. Uh, the message that I mentioned before, this is, is just your success is not just the success 
of the tech industry in Latin America and the Caribbean, but the sector that your company supports, land transportation, logistics. Tell us how new technologies are data are transforming the land transportation business in Latin America, because Avancargo is one of the key players there. Okay, thanks, Miguel, for having me, our organizers. Um, Do you wanna, if I, you want to switch to Spanish, I, I will switch to Spanish. Get ready with the earphones, <laughs> because I think yeah. you're going to listen to the response it's in Spanish. To get Please, to the point. go ahead uh, in Spanish, Diego. So, well... Yes, I would like to continue in uh, Spanish. Thank you very much. Ms. Miguel, you asked a question, and I can say that in the private sector, that when it comes to transports, and particularly on land transport, the different kinds of technologies that we need for land transports are consistently being developed by us. And I can say that after COVID-19, we have received and accepted many different kinds of technologies, particularly in this sector, which is surprising because it was very traditional, very distant uh, from technology. I think that uh, 20 years ago, we were not uh, cognizant of the fact that we will have this digital transformation, but I can say that we have gone down that path. And there are three scenarios we can think about. So first is these small businesses, about uh, five or so of these uh, trucks, only these uh, small, these businesses that maybe operate one to five trucks, and they are responsible for about 80 to 90% of these uh, transports, uh, logistics platforms. And through e-check, they had no choice but to adopt these uh, digitalization platforms. And by mobilizing these different services and digital platforms, they had no choice uh, but to offer these services. I'm talking about e-tech and AI. All of these uh, technologies might seem a little bit still very conventional, but they represent a huge change for Latin American region because they may seem like small steps, but we are going beyond the uh, first major gateway for digital transformation. And through that, I believe that we can get to a bigger change. When we consider the role of the government, I think that major bottlenecks that tend to occur in those uh, areas that are dealing with the customs process or approval processes. And these are the areas where government intervention is necessary because sometimes we don't have any government help uh, in these areas. And so we need to have more rapid and transparent and more activated data networks to go over these bottlenecks. And to do so, the government has to more systematically participate in this uh, area with a more sense of uh, responsibility and accountability. And particularly, I think that the government should place more of a focus on small businesses and SMEs because when it comes to demand and supply and the different kinds of uh, processes that the government is obligating companies to do. In the past, these were all manual, but now we need to make them digital so that they can be done quickly and more efficiently. And that is why we have to adopt AI so that we can automate even the most general and most basic of processes so that they can be made more efficient. And to do so, we need uh, efforts from the private sector, but also from the public sector as well. Thank you. Team for the question that I have for, for Jorge. Jorge, um you come from a country, Paraguay, that has a digital agenda that is investing significant resources on that digital agenda with the support of the IDB as well. Uh, and TESA, your company, is, uh, is a big player. You, full, you offer full services related to, to digital, I mean, cloud, cybersecurity, data center services, etc. cetera. Uh, Tell us about your perspective on the role of the private sector in defining that, that digital agenda in Paraguay and if uh, the digital agenda is, is addressing all the needs of the private sector or, or needs something else that is not there and you would suggest that that gets incorporated. What's your view on that? First, uh, first I, I want to congratulate 
to the people who are working on this event. Uh, you guys are doing a very well job. Congratulations for it. Um, on the other hand, for me, it's an honor to be here uh, and contribute to the relationship between uh, Latin America and Korea, Latin America and Paraguay and Korea. Uh, on the other hand, I worked in the past for six years in a Korean global automotive company in Paraguay who established uh, their operations in Paraguay since 2013. So for me, I have special uh, feelings now for this country and for its culture. Uh, our government have learned 20 years ago, uh, ago a very important lesson this lesson has two elements that I want to share you uh, today. First, all economics, technological, and social decision must be serious, responsible, and professional. They have a very good point. And the, on the other hand, uh, the government promote and dynamic, permanent, a dialogue with the private sector. The consequence of this uh, job that we are doing very well since 20 years ago is that today Paraguay has social, political, economic, macroeconomic stability, and also we, are, we have the best business environment in Latin America. A global technological companies as and local technological companies in Paraguay uh, are working very closely with the public sector and proof of that is that uh, we have exponential technological solution in Paraguay for example IoT solution internet of things big data uh, artificial intelligence uh, process automatization blockchain, robotic, all that kind of solution we have in Paraguay. And uh, so that's a proof that we are working, we are working very well with the, with the public sector. Also, the, the public sector create uh, some institution that we are, that working very closely with the private sector. For example, the Ministry of uh, technological information and communication, uh, the National Science and Te Technological Council, the National Tele Telecommunication Council, all those organizations working uh, to promote and develop the digital environment. Uh, about what we could add today uh, in the digital agenda, First, we have to think um, and share that 60% of, uh, of the population in Paraguay uh, is under 35 years old. 40% of the population is under 25 years old. So we have a lot of young people. These young people have very important skills very important skill, creative, they are creative, they are dynamic, they are very smart, uh, they are entrepreneurial, uh, they learn it very fast, and some important point from Korean is that they are very hard worker, young people. So uh, if we, that skill, in that skill if you add that Paraguay is in the middle of South America, maybe we have to uh, think in the possibilities, in the possibilities to establish uh, industrial and technological clusters in Paraguay. We think that those industrial and technological cluster uh, could uh, capitalize the concept of nearshoring.
Excellent, Jorge. I think those clusters are coming because it's, uh, I've, I've heard before that need of, of Paraguay and these elections coming up next year. So any new government will probably have to take seriously that, that point. Thank you, Jorge. And uh, that gives us a good way to compare the approach of Paraguay with that of Korea. Dr. Kwon, how are you? Uh, fine. <laughs> uh, well, Korea, I was, in my introductory remarks, I mentioned the importance of the right government digital policies to create that ecosystem that makes the whole country advance, private sector and public sector. Tell us, in your view, how important is the, the new digital uh, deal uh, to strengthen, to promote that ICT ecosystem, to help the private sector to progress. What's, what's your view on that? that what, what can we learn from that Korean experience? Thank you, Big OK. Buenas uh, tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, host for giving me a great participation, participate, opportunity to participate in this uh, Korea LAC business summit. Uh, I will cover three topics. Uh, first, Korea's ICT sector after the digital New Deal. Uh, second, uh, KISD uh, policy consultations for LAC country. Uh, uh, last, uh, future ICT cooperations between Korea and LAC. C countries. Korea government implemented the Korean New Deal to overcome economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and preemptively respond to changes in economic social structures. It consists of the four pillars, the Digital New Deal and the Green New Deal, the Human New Deal, and the regional balance and New Deal. Uh, the Digital New Deal project was planned to overcome the economic crisis and create new jobs by integrating ICT into all industry fields with 40.9 billion US dollar until 2025. It spread across four categories, including uh, first, data, network, AI, DNA, ecosystems. Second, data infrastructure. Third, uh, hyper-connected society. Uh, Fourth, uh, digitalization of SOC. As a result, uh, okay, uh, I can give as a flagship uh, project in the digital new deal, uh, the data dam, data dam project in DNA ecosystem categories help to foster uh, the rapid growth of the data industry. As a result, the market size of the data industry grew by the average of 9.8% annually from 11.5 billion US dollar in 2016 to 16.7 uh, billion US dollar in 2020. The number of public firms uh, participating in the data dam project uh, quadrupled between 2019 and 2021. Uh, thanks to the voucher, voucher programs, the number of data AI firms increased threefold. Furthermore, more than 75% uh, of the project participants were non-ICT firms, indicating that the project helped the digital transformation of the tra traditional and legacy forms. The Korea IC industry is the key driving forces of the innovation and growth. IC ICT industry contributed 24.1% of the growth, which is the 1% point among the GDP growth of 4.1%. As the digital economy evolves, uh, it, is the, uh, it is needed to develop uh, statistics to support uh, programmatic uh, policy making. KISTI is 
uh, currently developing and producing data industry uh, statistics. Korea achievement uh, in the field of ICT has been acknowledged by many countries and they have big interest in benchmarking Korea success uh, stories. And Korea has been willing to share expertise, knowledge, and experiences in ICT development uh, for global co-prosperity. Uh, KISTI has taken part in the ICT development consultation program since 2002 with the support of the government uh, Ministry of Science and ICT in Latin America. KISTI has successfully conducted 19 uh, projects for eight countries by 2022. In uh, 2018, KISTI conducted the programs on the topics of digital economy for Colombia and smart city for Peru. The government of two countries were able to use the result of the consultation to obtain um, parliamentary approval and provide the guidelines for stakeholders. Ecuador is a partner country of the year 2020 on the topic of the spectrum management. The Ecuadorian government established related strategy based on the consultation result. In addition to the KISTIS policy consultation programs, MSIT, Ministry of Science and ICT, is supporting various cooperation programs for building infrastructure and capacity building in the field of ICT. About four months ago, a new government was established in Korea and the government just announced a new national data strategy. And it is expected that uh, data international partnerships such as Korea and LAC countries would be more strengthened in the future. Let me stop here. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwon. Um, very rich uh, uh, remarks in terms of data, and I have to uh, appreciate your flexibility in not sharing your, uh, Dr. Kwon prepared a PowerPoint, uh, <laughs> but just, just to keep the fluidness of the exchange, uh, he kindly agreed on, on just telling the data, but I encourage you to go to the KISD website because that PowerPoint is full of interesting data. And one of the, the things that come out of, of your numbers is the, the great rate of return of every dollar that the government invests in digital transformation. I mean, yes, 45 or $40 billion that you mentioned that will be invested by the Korean government in the uh, new digital deal sounds like a lot of money, right, for any government. But when you think that uh, the, the digital uh, transformation activity is already close to 5% of the GDP, of a huge GDP, the 10th biggest in the world, as is the case in Korea, that is generating a lot of economic activity and a lot of employment, right? So thank you for the presentation. Um, Jijun, uh, Great to see you here in the stage and share the stage with you. Uh, you represent a, a very successful private sector in Korea. Neighbor, right? The company that everyone knows here, probably. And it's an interesting case because uh, it's, you're one of the few countries that have that type of digital platform that has such a strong presence in the country. Uh, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the story of neighbor, how did you gain that strong position in the country and what, uh, how does the future look like for neighbor and, and what are the plans, please? Thank okay. you, you. Yeah. Thank you for having me in this wonderful meeting and kindly introducing neighbor as well as myself. My name is Yoon and I'm working at neighbor for the Division of Government Relations. Naval started its business in 1999 as a search engine service provider and also a portal service delivering uh, useful information for users. 
For more than 20 years, the competition landscape surrounding neighbor has changed a lot. Global dominant players like Google, YouTube, and Meta have attracted many users. However, in Korea, neighbor still has the largest number of users for search and related services. User demographics is evenly distributed from kindergartners to juniors and seniors in their 70s and 80s. Our vision is to connect people and the world. Pursuing this goal, Neighbor has expanded its business portfolio to messenger, online commerce, and content business such as Webtoon and Web Noble, and also the Metaverse platform. The brand name is Jepeto. Furthermore, based upon our technological capabilities, which was accumulated from this kind of service experiences, Neighbor now provides cloud services as Amazon does, and also data analytics and AI applied services for our business partners. Currently, all these services are available not only in Korea, uh, but also in many other countries, particularly in Asian countries, Japan, Thailand, and Taiwan. When it comes to our future goal, I must share with you neighbors' enthusiasm for technology development. Neighbor has constantly innovated and challenged itself to better serve users, and therefore has strived to acquire top-notch phenomenal technologies. Given the huge amount of money involved, and also the availability of talented workforces to require for this kind of top level R&D, it has not been an easy way to take for neighbor. But neighbor has endeavored to not fall behind global players. So as a result, um, I think that today, Naver has become a kind of tech convergence platform, which enables workspaces and things thereof and workforces to be conversed and connected. The thing demonstrating its evolution is the Naver's newly constructed second headquarter office. Its brand name is 1784. That means the address number and also the year when the Industrial Revolution started. The construction was completed in May this year, and it shows you up collaboration of neighbors' wide range of technology, especially the ARC. ARC means AI, robot, and cloud. In our new building, robot delivers coffee and my lunchbox, and they communicate through 5G network, and they use cloud services. Brain is drop. Neighbor believes that this building will be the test bed for new services, technology, and products for a lot of startups, entrepreneurs, and academic researchers from worldwide. With this building symbolizing our vision, we hope to connect more people and the world globally. Particularly, we are committed to collaborate with rap countries and hope to meet users of Latin American countries. Yeah. Very good. That was what I wanted to hear, Jijun, and uh, the connection with Latin American countries. So. That's in your plans. Do you currently have any uh, business in Latin America or any partnership? Because I'm sure you will find a lot of entrepreneurs and companies ready to partner with Neighbor. Any company that can compete with such a powerful company like Google mm -hmm. deserves admiration. 
So any Latin American presence yet or any plans or any partners? Yeah, we are providing webtoon services and metaverse services in Latin America. Not many users, but we are trying to expand our presence. Yeah. Excellent. I'm sure we're going to find good partners here. Thank you, Jun. So, uh, Minister Maria Luisa, back to you. Uh, digital transformation can be done and well done in small countries as well. I mentioned Uruguay as a reference in the region. Estonia is a good reference in Europe. El Salvador wants to take its place there, right? So I've heard about the El Salvador Digital Nation plans. Can you share with us what, what those plans are, please? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Miguel Angel. And, um, and yes, uh, that's what we are very focused since the beginning of, our, of the administration of President Bukele. That's three years and about three months ago. Uh, we uh, started a conversation with the technology sector in order to understand what prevented uh, the companies uh, to grow, uh, given that we knew we had the talent, we knew we had the right entrepreneurial skills, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the sector, uh, we believe there's a lot of potential uh, that still need to, need, we need to, to promote. And this is how uh, we built our digital nation ecosystem where we're working together uh, with different government uh, institutions and very important, the private sector, who had provided this input and we have put together uh, these, uh, we're working together uh, to, to, to create this ecosystem where technology companies, either if, if, uh, if this is a startup, if this is a multinational company, a medium Salvadorian company, they all find the right conditions in El Salvador to be able to establish, grow and operate uh, in uh, a, 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 an agile, fashion. Uh, of course, this is something that we're doing with uh, with all the sectors of our economy. We're creating the right environment for growth. Uh, but we uh, believe that the technology se sector is a very strategic sector in order uh, to provide opportunities uh, for our population to provide new, uh, new jobs and jobs that are well uh, remunerated. Uh, and this is how we, we came with, uh, with our, we came out with our ecosystem that we're currently working. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the talent. Talent is one of the main components uh, of this, uh, of this ecosystem. Uh, we identify, uh, and, and we, and this is something that happened in various sectors, unfortunately, in, in El Salvador economy before, that demand was not linked to, to the supply of labor. And uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we have created uh, together with the private sector, the Tech Skills Council that allow us to identify what is it, the exact profile uh, that companies need in order to grow. Uh, the feedback is very important, uh, but the private sector has gone farther. They, they are involved uh, in the development of the curriculum. They are, they are involved in the selection of the youth that's going to participate in training programs. And I, I want to share uh, with, with everyone th that this has been part of the success of these projects that we're implementing. So talent, uh, a, huge, uh, a huge part of this, uh, of, of this ecosystem. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, companies, even though they had a demand of their products and services, they didn't have the right talent, which is sad, but at the same time, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and and we, I discussed later about telecommunications in order to be able to be the host of technology companies and have our companies grow more. Now we have a company, for instance, in El Salvador growing 300%. Uh, but for more companies to be able to take advantage to the, uh, of this digital transformation that's, that's going on in El Salvador, uh, it's important to have the right coverage of telecommunication services. It's important to have the, the, the coverage, but the quality, it's also very important. Financial, uh, financial access, access to credit was also one of the limitations of the technological uh, local uh, se uh, sector. Uh, in, in El Salvador, and we are working together uh, with local banks in order to make sure that the companies uh, that, are, that are part of the technology sector have the right products that adapt 
to their needs and the reality of the technological sector. Regulatory framework, another area uh, that we believe is very important, a regulatory framework that, that, that it's modern, uh, that forces the government to be agile and that provide the right incentives. That's also something that we have worked, again, specifically in the sector of technology, but also this is uh, something that we're working uh, in terms of our entire economy. We also identified that a, a, a challenge for com technology companies to grow uh, was the, the lack of opportunities to go and promote themselves and be able to find new buyers, and also uh, the efforts that needed to happen in order to attract investment to El Salvador. And these are two, two areas that ha we have also included in an ecosystem. We're uh, working together uh, with uh, various institutions uh, in El Salvador in order to make sure that everyone around the world knows uh, that El Salvador uh, has the potential in the, in, in the technology sector, uh, and also we're working uh, more and more actively in order to attract more investment of technology companies uh, in El Salvador. We believe that uh, the ecosystem uh, approach is a way to go about. Uh, we can work, create, and, and have the best talent, but if we don't have the right regulatory framework or we don't have the, uh, the right levels of, of, of telecommunication services and, and, and the, the quality, uh, that El Salvador will not be able to, uh, to, to achieve the most of this huge opportunity that we have uh, basically in our face, right? Uh, the opportunity is there. And we have brought the different actors that need to be uh, in the uh, in the table. That's something again that it's we believe it's part of the key of success uh, that we're seeing currently in El Salvador. Uh, El Salvador has positioned itself as being at the forefront of financial technology, and we're building uh, this digital nation in this positioning that El Salvador has had after the adoption of uh, Bitcoin as a legal tender. So the fintech sector is one of the strategic sectors, uh, the, the, the fintech cryptocurrency sector, uh, but also the outsourcing of technology services is one of, of our key approaches. And all those uh, companies that are incorporating artificial intelligence uh, in their business models in order to uh, address a challenge of the private or the public sector, those, all, all, all of these uh, areas are of interest uh, of, of El Salvador. And just to, to share uh, some of the results that uh, we have already seen, uh, given the approach that El Salvador has taken into adopting technology and innovating, uh, just in the past year, 60, 62, 62 new companies have established in El Salvador in the fintech sector. So I would just like to invite everyone uh, in the room uh, to, to um, get to know more about the experience of El Salvador, come to El Salvador and be part of this transformation. Thank you, Mr. In fact, that, that number reminded me, I don't know, I don't think Gemma Sacristan, my colleague from uh, IDB Invest mentioned the figure, but in fact, COVID-19 uh, COVID brought just many negative things to the world and to human beings. But one of the only positive ones that brought this uh, the push to the digital agenda, right? We, we know that. And uh, in the middle of the pandemic in 2021, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there were more than 400 venture capital deals uh, for an amount of $4 billion. This is to say there is an entrepreneurial sector in the tech uh, business in Latin America that is ready to do business and ready to partner. So thank you for reminding me that, Minister. So talent, again, is coming up, the talent, the human aspect of it. Uh, Diego, um, that's a problem for the tech sector, for the private sector and the public one in, in, in Latin America. What do you see as uh, potential solutions to close the gap uh, of availability of digital talent? Uh, what do you see as the role of governments, of multilaterals, private sector, how can they work together to solve that problem, in your view? That is an excellent question. It's a very difficult uh, question to answer. Well, it is true that we lack talents, especially those with digital skills are lacking. There is a lot of demand for such talent, but unfortunately, the supply of such talents is not as much as the demand. So there's a lot of job openings for those with digital skills, uh, but 
Despite the job openings for the youth when they first enter into the labor market, we can see that also there's not enough education and training provided for people uh, to grow into such digital talents. All of the young students and the youth are in a situation in which they have to change their mindsets, especially when it comes to technology. In the past, for example, the situation is different compared to 20 years ago when we were being educated. My boss uh, was trained as an engineer, but every six months, well, uh, but also uh, there is a need to be retrained every six months, and that is why we have to continuously discover the talents and also the traditional education has uh, institutions have to work with the private sector so that we can strengthen the education and training for digital skills so that we can shorten the time required for training the required talents. We really have a shortage of talents, and we have to overcome this challenge. Uh, in Argentina, this is an area where we can see full employment taking place. So we do understand the need for fostering talents. The society as a whole has to change uh, mindsets. And also, I've been trained and educated in Argentina. I've been in the public education system. I've received traditional education. And in fact, um, the mindsets of the engineers or the science and technology field also has to change. And I think that the public sector has a role to play, not only the government, but also uh, multilateral organizations and also startups and joint ventures. Uh, everyone have to change their mindsets. And also the employers uh, have to change as well. For example, uh, I'm in the transportation sector, the logistics sector. We also have to change our mindsets. In particular, when it comes to digitalization, in order for the traditional sectors to promote digitalization, the employers have to change their views, their perspectives, and the startups. Well, we have heard about the digital natives, but also the traditional generation, the older generation also have to change their mindsets. I think um, that's all to what I can say about this topic. But what is important is that we need continuous change. And also we need a change of the education system in the short term. The gap of digital talent in Latin America and the Caribbean is quantified to, to about half a million people that are needed right now and we don't have. So we need to find a solution. Uh, Jorge, back to Paraguay. Um, you have an important indigenous population in, in Paraguay, and you have an indigenous official language, right, the Guarani. Uh, that, that's one of the diversity aspects uh, of any, any country. The question is along the lines of what I asked the minister before, but in this, in this occasion from the private sector perspective, what can the government do to be sure that the digital agenda currently implementation is more inclusive. It brings everyone on board. Thanks for the question. Uh, we see four or five suggestions that we will share today to be more inclusive, the digital environment to everyone. Uh, first is we have to accelerate the digital identity <clears throat> for individuals and also for companies to their interactions in digital environment. And the second point is that we must, uh, we have to map all the interactions between individuals and companies between uh, the government all these operations with the government has to be done by digital environment automatization. That is very important also. The third one is uh, in Paraguay, we have to initiate the convert of normal cities in smart cities. 
we have the solutions. Uh, our technological companies have the solution to initiate that process, that digital transformation, and uh, convert those cities in smart cities. The fourth point is that uh, we must develop uh, more faster human resources in technological skills because uh, they are growing very fast. The foreign investment and the local investment, so those companies demand a lot of human resources with technological skills in IoT, in big data, artificial intelligence, blockchains. So we have to accelerate those points. Uh, maybe we have to think to establish uh, technological universities technological institutions, technological labs in Paraguay, and from there be a knowledge hub of technological for Mercosur and from Latin America. That will capitalize, uh, capitalize uh, as I said before, the concept of nearshoring. And the, the final suggestion is Paraguay have a uh, social harmony, have flexible and simple legal system, uh, has stability in economics and politicals, and a very low uh, cost in raw material and production process. So uh, a very important decision for all uh, companies, uh, Korean companies could be establish their operation in Paraguay as a industrial and technological technological clusters and convert its operation in Latin America uh, or in Paraguay as a hub for logistics from product from service and from technological technological matters. That is the my suggestions. Thank you, Jorge. Um, Jijun, um, a company like Neighbor, given the size and relevance, has a lot of a lot of power to improve things in society. Can you share with us any uh, case of good collaboration with the government, Korean or any government, to solve a social problem? How can Neighbor leverage on its its power and knowledge to solve a social problem. Thank you. How, how many minutes do we have left? You have a couple of days. We didn't tell anyone, but you are sleeping here today. Uh, <laughs> the sleeping bags will be distributed soon. <laughs> no, you have exactly like three minutes, Jijun, sorry, because we have six minutes to, to leave, sorry. Because... If we don't have much time left, I want to highlight upon the, uh, the importance of broadband infrastructure rather than delivering neighbors' experience with the government. So can I do that? Yes, please. OK. <laughs> yeah. uh, so our distinguished moderator uh, introduced me uh, first stage. I had worked at IDB uh, for two and a half years from 20, 2012 to 2014. At the time, I, with my uh, IDB colleague, my lovely brother Antonio, we really worked hard for expanding uh, penetration of fiber networks in the red countries. But it was not an easy job. But I think that the that country's government must directly deal with broadband penetration rather than setting it aside as an issue of private careers. Because I think that broadband infrastructure is a kind of a prerequisite to address social and economic problems through, through digitalization. So my last suggestion is that let's review the environment of broadband infrastructure and then check. And take care of it directly by the government. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jijun, and within time. I know you have many more ideas and experiences to share, but uh, I invite everyone to reach into Neighbor and Jijun to go in depth about those, uh, those experiences. Uh, Dr. Kwon, I think you elaborated all your messages in your uh, first round. You didn't have a second one. If you wanna take one minute or two to uh, add an extra message, please, please do so. Uh, if not, we'll we'll wrap it up. Would you like to to make a final statement? Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to uh, uh, comment. And uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the, some evolution of the partnership between countries. Okay, so. Uh, the topic of the policy consultation uh, in the KIST cases, uh, consultation is a very first step uh, for the, some good cooperations, okay? After the consultation, we can um, give some uh, big investment and something, okay? So, uh, but uh, such a topic for the policy consultation is evolving in line, line with the rapid changes in technologies, regulation, market, and consequently the demand from the uh, partner country. So uh, connectivity issues, some communications, online world is the, uh, was the most uh, demanded topic uh, Follow the digital economy uh, policies, uh, trust and use for last uh, five years. So uh, we are ready to help the LAC countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwon. That was a great message. Actually, you, you stole my, my kind of wrapping up message. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I just want to uh, seriously thank you for such an interesting exchange. Uh, I reiterate my words. I feel privileged to have this conversation with you all. I hope it was of value to the audience. Uh, thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, until the very end, I think it was uh, a very interesting uh, and rich uh, journey about any matters, not just digital transformation. And I would say we probably start, uh, we probably finish with the messages that, that the opening remarks uh, of the authorities started, which is uh, there is a lot of value in the experience of Korea. It's a reference, it's an example in many fields, in digital in particular. Latin American and Caribbean countries have progressed significantly in the digital agenda and they're ready to be partners for Korean companies and to work with, with the government. And from the IDB, we are extremely thankful to the government of Korea for the technical and financial support that is paying off as, as you have seen in this panel for the many solutions and progresses that we have made. So thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience. And uh, I guess we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Let's give a big round of applause to our panelists and the moderator. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, we hope that through this summit, entrepreneurs and government officials of both regions will find relevant tools and insight to boost mutual prosperity and growth through cooperation. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for your participation until the very end. And this evening, we will have a welcome reception and a banquet hosted by the Export Import Bank of the Republic of Korea at the Grand Saloon. So ladies and gentlemen, those who are reserved and invited, um, our LAC delegations and Korean embassies, uh, please make your way to Grand Saloon by 6 p.m. Please enjoy your evening and uh, tomorrow we will have uh, four topical seminars and one-on-one -on -one business meetings and we will also have a startup pitch day throughout the day. So for more information please refer to our program books or the summit's official website. And uh, ladies and gentlemen tomorrow we will have the farewell dinner for our leg delegations and Korean impetus as well and uh, that will be placed at the Signal Seoul in Lotte Tower. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for your attendance. And this brings us to the end of the day one. Thank you and goodbye.